I come no more to make you laugh. Things now that bear a weighty and a serious brow, Sad, high, and working full of state and woe, Such noble scenes as draw the eye to flow, We now present. Those that can pity here may, if they think it well, Let fall a tear. The subject will deserve it. Such as give their money out of hope they may believe, May here find truth too. Those that come to see only a show or two, And so agree the play may pass, if they be still and willing, I'll undertake may see away their shilling richly in two short hours. Only they that come to hear a merry bawdy play. A noise of targets, or to see a fellow in a long motley coat guarded with yellow, will be deceived. For, gentle hearers know, to rank our chosen truth with such a show as fool and fight is, Beside forfeiting our own brains, and the opinion that we bring to make that only true we now intend, will leave us never an understanding friend. Therefore, for goodness' sake, and as you are known the first and happiest hearers of the town, be sad as we would make ye, think ye see the very persons of our noble story as they were living, think you see them great and followed with the general throng and sweat of thousand friends, then, in a moment, see how soon this mightiness meets misery. And if you can be merry, then I'll say, a man may weep upon his wedding day. <laughs> Well met. How have you done since last we saw in France? My lord of Buckingham, I thank your grace. Healthful. And ever since a fresh admirer of what I saw there. An untimely egg you stayed me a prisoner in my chamber when those sons of glory, those two lights of men, met in the Vale of Andrent. Twixt Guin and Ard. I was then present. Saw them salute on horseback, beheld them when they lighted, how they clung in their embracement as they grew together. Which had they? What four-throned ones could have weighed such a compounded one? All the whole time I was my chamber's prisoner. Then you lost the view of earthly glory. Men might say, till this time Pomp was single, but now married to one above itself. Each following day became the next day's master, till the last made former wonders its. Today the French, all clinquent, all in gold, like heathen gods, shone down the English, and tomorrow they made Britain India. Every man that stood showed like a mine. Their dwarfish pages were as cherubims, all gilt. The madams, too, not used to toil, did almost sweat to bear the pride upon them, that their very labour was to them as a painting. Now this mask was cried incomparable, and the ensuing night made it a fool and beggar. The two kings, equal in luster, were now best, now worst, as presents did present them. Him in eye, still him in praise, and being present both, t'was said they saw but one, and no discerner durst wag his tongue in censure. When these sons, for so they phrase em, by their heralds challenged the noble spirits to arms they did perform beyond thought's compass, that former fabulous story, being now seen possible enough, got credit, that Beavis was believed. Oh, you go far, my lord of Norfolk. As I belong to worship and affect in honour, honesty, the tract of everything, would by a good discourser lose some life which action self was tongue to. All was royal, to the disposing of it naught rebelled. Order gave each thing view. The office did distinctly his full function. Who did guide? I mean, who set the body and the limbs of this great sport together? As you guess... One set is that promises no element in such a business. I pray you who, my lord? All this was ordered by the good discretion of the right reverend cardinal of York. A devil speed him. No man's pie is freed from his ambitious finger. What had he to do in these fierce vanities? I wonder that such a keech can with his very bulk take up the ray of the beneficial sun and keep it from the earth. Surely, sir, there's in him stuff that puts him to these ends. 
for being not propped by ancestry, whose grace chalks successors their way, nor called upon for high feats done to the crown, neither allied to eminent assistance, but spider-like out of his self-drawing web, that gives us note. The force of his own merit makes his way, a gift that heaven gives for him, which buys a place next to the king. I cannot tell what heaven hath given him. Let some graver eye pierce into that. But I can see his pride peep through each part of him. Whence has he that? If not from hell, the devil is a niggard. All has given all before, and he begins a new hell in himself. Why the devil, upon this French going out, took he upon him, without the privity of the king, to appoint who should attend on him? He makes up the file of all the gentry, for the most part such to whom as great a charge as little honour he meant to lay upon. And his own letter, the Honourable Board of Council, out must fetch him in here papers. I do know kinsmen of mine, three at the least, that have by this so sickened their estates that never they shall abound as formerly. Oh, many have broke their backs with laying manners on them for this great journey. What did this vanity but minister communication of a most poor issue? Grievingly, I think the peace between the French and us not values the cost that it concluded. Every man, after the hideous storm that followed, was a thing inspired, and not consulting, broke into a general prophecy that this tempest, dashing the garment of this peace, aboded the sudden breach on Which is butted out, for France hath floored the league, and hath attached our merchants' goods at Bordeaux. Is it therefore the ambassador is silenced? Mary is. A proper title of a peace, and purchased at a superfluous rate. Why, all this business our reverend cardinal carried. Like it, your grace, the state takes notice of the private difference betwixt you and the cardinal. I advise you. And take it from a heart that wishes towards you honour and plenteous safety, that you read the Cardinal's malice and his potency together, to consider further, that what his high hatred would affect wants not a minister in his power. You know his nature, that he's revengeful, and I know his sword hath a sharp edge. It's long, and may be said it reaches far, and where it will not extend thither, he darts it. Bosom up my counsel, you'll find it wholesome. Lo, where comes that rock that I advise your shunning? The Duke of Buckingham Surveyor. Oh, where's his examination? Here, so please you. Is he in person ready? Aye, please your grace. Well, we shall then know more. And Buckingham shall lessen this big look. <sighs> this butcher's cur is venom-mouthed, and I have not the power to muzzle him. Therefore best not wake him in his slumber. A beggar's book outworth a noble's blood. What are you chafed? Ask God for temperance. That's the appliance only which your disease requires. My Redin's looks matter against me, and his eye reviled me as his abject object. At this instant he bores me with some trick. He's gone to the king. I'll follow and outstay him. Stay, my lord, and let your reason with your collar question what tis you go about. To climb steep hills requires slow pace at first. Anger is like a full hot horse, who being allowed his way, self-metal tires him. Not a man in England can advise me like you. Be to yourself as you would to your friend. I'll to the king, and from a mouth of honour, quite cry down this Ipswich fellow's insolence, or proclaim this difference in no person. Be advised. Heat not a furnace for your foe so hot that it do singe yourself. We may outrun by violent swiftness that which we run at and lose by overrunning. No, you're not the fire that mounts the liquor till run o'er in seeming to augment it wastes it. Be advised, I say again, there is no English soul more stronger to direct you than yourself, if with the sap of reason you would quench or but allay the fire of passion. Sir, I am thankful to you, and I'll go along by your prescription, but this top-proud fellow, who from a flow of gall I name not, but from sincere motions, by intelligence, and proofs as clear as founts in July, when we see each grain of gravel, I do know to be corrupt and treasonous. Say not treasonous. To the king I'll say it, and make my vouch as strong as sure of rock. Attend. This holy fox, or wolf, or both, for he is equal ravenous as he is subtle and as prone to mischief as able to perform it, his mind and place infecting one another, yea, reciprocally, only to show his pomp as well in France as here at home, suggests the king our master to this last costly treaty, the interview that swallowed so much treasure and like a glass did break in the wrenching. Faith, and so it did. Pray give me favour, sir. This cunning cardinal, the articles of the combination, drew as himself pleased, and they were ratified as he cried, thus let be, to as much end as give a crutch to the dead. But our Count Cardinal has done this, and tis well. For worthy Wolsey, who cannot err, uh, he did it. Now this follows, which, as I take it, is a kind of puppy to the old damn treason. Charles, the Emperor, under pretense to see the Queen his aunt, what was indeed his colour, but he came to whisper, Wolsey, here makes visitation. 
His fears were that the interview betwixt England and France might through their amity breed him some prejudice, for from this league peeped harms that menaced him privily deals with our cardinal, and as I trow, which I do well, for I am sure the emperor paid ere he promised, whereby his suit was granted ere it was asked. But when the way was made, and paved with gold, the emperor thus desired that he would please to alter the king's course, and break the foresaid peace. Let the king know, as soon he shall by me, that thus the cardinal does buy and sell his honour as he pleases, and for his own advantage. I am sorry to hear this of him, and could wish he was something mistaken in. No, not a syllable. I do pronounce him in that very shape he shall appear in proof. Your office, sergeant. Execute him. Sir. My lord, the Duke of Buckingham, and Earl of Hereford, Stafford, and Northampton, I arrest thee of high treason in the name of our most sovereign king. Lo, no, you, my lord. The net has fallen upon me. I shall perish under device and practice. I am sorry to see you turn from liberty to look on the business present. Tis his highness pleasure you shout to the tower. It will help me nothing to plead mine innocence, for that die is on me, which makes my whitest part black. The will of heaven be done in this and all things. I obey. Oh, my lord, I began it. Fare you well. Nay, he must bear you company. Huh? The king is pleased you shout to the tower till you know how he determines further. As the duke said, the will of heaven be done, and the king's pleasure by me obeyed. Here is a warrant from the king to attach Lord Montacute and the bodies of the duke's confessor, John de la Carr, uh, one Gilbert Perk, his chancellor. So, so, these are the limbs of the plot. No more, I hope. Uh, a monk of the Chartreux. Oh, Nicholas Hopkins. He. My surveyor is false. Your great cardinal hath showed him gold. My life is spanned already. I am the shadow of poor Buckingham, whose figure even this instant cloud puts on by darkening my clear sun. My lord, farewell. Wolsey, my life itself, and the best heart of it, thanks you for this great care. I stood in the level of a full-charged confederacy, and give thanks to you that choked it. Let be called before us that gentleman of Buckingham's. In person I'll hear him his confessions justify, and point by point the treasons of his master he shall again relate. Room for the Queen! Rise, my queen. Nay, we must longer kneel. I am a suitor. Arise, and take place by us. Half your suit, never name to us. You have half our power. The other moiety, ere you ask, is given. Repeat your will, and take it. Thank your majesty. That you would love yourself, and in that love not unconsidered leave your honour nor the dignity of your office is the point of my petition. Lady mine, proceed. I am solicited, not by a few, and those of true condition, that your subjects are in great grievance. There have been commissions sent down among them, which has floored the heart of all their loyalties, wherein, although my good lord cardinal, they vent reproaches most bitterly on you as putter on of these exactions, Yet the king, our master, whose honour heaven shield from soil, even he escapes not language unmannerly. Yea, such which breaks the sides of loyalty, and almost appears in loud rebellion. Not almost appears, it doth appear. For upon these taxations the clothiers all, not able to maintain the many to them longing, have put off the spinsters, carders, fullers, weavers, who, unfit for other life, compelled by hunger and lack of other means, in desperate manner, daring the event to the teeth, are all in uproar, and danger serves among them. Taxation? Wherein and what taxation? My Lord Cardinal, you that are blamed for it, alike with us, know you of this taxation? Please you, sir, I know but of a single part in aught pertains to the state, and front but in that file where others tell steps with me. No, my Lord. 
You know no more than others, but you frame things that are known alike, which are not wholesome to those which would not know them, and yet must perforce be their acquaintance. These exactions, whereof my sovereign would have note, they are most pestilent to the hearing, and to bear them the back is sacrificed to the load. They say they are devised by you, or else you suffer too hard an exclamation. Still exaction, the nature of it, in what kind let's know is this exaction? I am much too venturous in tempting of your patience, but emboldened under your promised pardon. The subject's grief comes through commissions which compels from each the sixth part of his substance to be levied without delay, and the pretense for this is named your wars in France. This makes bold mouths, tongues spit their duties out, and cold hearts freeze allegiance in them. Their curses now live where their prayers did, and it's come to pass this tractable obedience is a slave to each insensate will. I would your highness would give it quick consideration, for there is no primer business. By my life, this is against our pleasure. And for me, I have no further gone in this than by a single voice. And that not passed me but by learned approbation of the judges. If I am traduced by ignorant tongues, which neither know my faculties nor person, yet will be the chronicles of my doing, let me say it is but the fate of place and the rough break that virtue must go through. We must not stint our necessary actions in the fear to cope malicious censurers, which ever, as ravenous fishes, do a vessel follow that is new trimmed, but benefit no further than vainly longing. What we oft do best by sick interpreters, once weak ones, is not ours or not allowed. What worst, as oft hitting a grosser quality, is cried up for our best act. If we shall stand still, in fear our motion will be mocked or carped at, we should take root here where we sit, or sit state statues only. Things done well, and with a care, exempt themselves from fear. Things done without example, in their issue, are to be feared. Have you a precedent of this commission? I believe not any. We must not rend our subjects from our laws and stick them in our will. Six part of each? A trembling contribution. Why, we take from every tree, lop, bark, and part of the timber, and though we leave it with a root, thus hacked, the air will drink the sap. To every county where this is questioned, Send our letters with free pardon to each man that has denied the force of this commission. Pray look to it, I put it to your care. A word with you. Let there be letters writ to every shire of the king's grace and pardon. The grieved commons hardly conceive of me. Let it be noised that through our intercession this revocement and pardon comes. I shall anon advise you further in the proceeding. Your grace. I am sorry that the Duke of Buckingham is run in your displeasure. It grieves many. The gentleman is learned, and a most rare speaker, to nature none more bound. His training such that he may furnish and instruct great teachers, and never seek for aid out of himself. Yet see, when these so noble benefits shall prove not well disposed, the mind growing once corrupt, they turn to vicious forms ten times more ugly than ever they were fair. This man, so complete, who was enrolled amongst wonders, and when we, almost with ravished listening, could not find his hour of speech a minute, he, my lady, hath into monstrous habits put the graces that once were his, and has become as black as if besmeared in hell. Sit by us. You shall hear this was his gentleman in trust, of him things to strike honour sad. Bid him recount the four recited practices, whereof we cannot feel too little, hear too much. Stand forth, and with bold spirit relate what you, most like a careful subject, have collected out of the Duke of Buckingham. Speak freely. First, it was usual with him. Every day it would infect his speech that if the king should without issue die, he'll carry it so to make the scepter his. These very words I've heard him utter to his son-in-law, Lord Abergeny, to whom by oath he menaced revenge upon the cardinal. 
Please, Your Highness, note this dangerous conception in this point. Not friended by his wish to your high person, his will is most malignant, and it stretches beyond you to your friend. My learned Lord Cardinal, deliver all with charity. Speak on. How grounded he his title to the crown upon our fail? To this point hast thou heard him at any time speak aught? He was brought to this by a vain prophecy of Nicholas Henton. What was that, Henton? Sir, a Chartres friar, his confessor, who fed him every minute with words of sovereignty. How knowst thou this? Not long before your highness sped to France, the duke being at the Rose, within the parish St. Lawrence Putney, did of me demand what was the speech among the Londoners concerning the French journey. And I replied men feared the French would prove perfidious to the king's danger. Presently, the duke said twas the fear indeed, and that he doubted twould prove the verity of certain words spoke by a holy monk, that oft, says he, hath sent to me, wishing me to commit John de la Carr, my chaplain, a choice hour to hear from him a matter of some moment, whom after, under the confession seal, he solemnly had sworn that what he spoke, my chaplain to no creature living but to me should utter. With demure confidence, this pausingly ensued. Neither the king nor the heirs, tell you the duke, shall prosper. Bid him strive to win the love of the commonalty. The duke shall govern England. If I know you well, you were the duke's surveyor, and lost your office on the complaint of the tenants. Take good heed, you charge not in your spleen a noble person, and spoil your nobler soul. I say take heed, yea, heartily beseech you. Let him on, go forward. On my soul, I'll speak but truth. I told my lord, the duke, by the devil's illusions the monk might be deceived, and that was dangerous to ruminate on this so far until it forged him some design which being believed it was much like to do. He answered, Tush, he can do me no damage, adding further that had the king in his last sickness failed, the cardinals and Sir Thomas Lovell's head should have gone off. Ha! What? So rank? <laughs> There's mischief in this man. Canst thou say further? I can, my liege. Proceed. Being at Greenwich, after your highness had reproved the duke about Sir William Boomer... I remember of such a time. Being my sworn servant, the duke retained him his. But on, what hence? If, quoth he, I for this had been committed as to the tower, I thought, I would have played the part my father meant to act upon the usurper Richard, who, being at Salisbury, made suit to come in's presence, which if granted as he made semblance of his duty, would have put his knife into him. A giant traitor! Now, madam, may his highness live in freedom, and this man out of prison. God, my lord. There's something more would out of thee. What sayest? After the duke, his father, with the knife, he stretched him, and with one hand on his dagger, another spread on his breast, mounting his eyes, he did discharge a horrible oath whose tenor was, were he evil used, he would outgo his father by as much as a performance does an irresolute purpose. There's his period to sheath his knife in us. He is attached. Call him to present trial. If he may find mercy in the law, tis his. If none, let him not seek to us. By day and night, he's traitor to the height. <laughs> it's possible the spells of France should juggle men into such strange mysteries. New customs, <laughs> though they be never so ridiculous, nay, let them be unmanly, yet are followed. As far as I see, all the good our English have got by the late voyages, but merely a fit or two of the face, but they are shrewd ones. For when they hold them, you would swear directly their very noses had been counsellors to Pepin or Clefarius, <laughs> they keep state so. They have all new legs and lame ones. One would take it that never see them pace before, the spavin, uh, a spring halt reigned among them. Death, my lord, their clothes are after such a pagan cut to it that sure they've worn out Christendom. <laughs> How now? What news, Sir Thomas Lovell? Faith, my lord, I hear of none but the new proclamation that's clapped upon the court gate. What is it for? 
The reformation of our travelled gallants that fill the court with quarrels, talk, and tailors. <laughs> I'm glad tis there. Now, I would pray our messieurs to think an English courtier may be wise and never see the loom. They must either, for so run the conditions, leave those remnants of fool and feather that they got in France, with all their honourable points of ignorance pertaining thereunto, as fights and fireworks, abusing better men than they can be out of a foreign wisdom, renouncing clean the faith they have in tennis and tall stockings, <laughs> short blistered breeches, and those types of travel, and understand again like honest men or pack to their old playfellows. <laughs> there, I take it, they may cum privilegio we away the lag end of their lewdness and be laughed at. <laughs> Tis time to give them physic. Their diseases are grown so catching. What a loss our ladies will have of these trim vanities. Ay, marry, there will be woe indeed, lords. The sly horsons have got a speeding trick to lay down ladies. A French song and a fiddle has no fellow. Oh, the devil fiddle them. I am glad they are going, for sure there's no converting of them. Now, an honest country lord, as I am, beaten a long time out of play, may bring his plain song and have an hour of hearing, and by a lady, held current music, too. Well said, Lord Sands. Your colt's tooth is not cast yet? No, my lord, nor shall not, while I have a stump. <laughs> Sir Thomas, whither were you a-going? Uh, to the Cardinals. Your lordship is a guest, too. Oh, it is true. This night he makes a supper, and a great one, to many lords and ladies. There will be the beauty of of this kingdom, I'll assure you. That churchman bears a bounteous mind indeed, a hand as fruitful as the land that feeds us. His dues fall everywhere. Oh, no doubt he's noble. He had a black mouth that said other of him. He may, my <laughs> lord, has wherewithal. In him, sparing would show a worse sin than ill doctrine. Men of his way should be most liberal. They are <laughs> set here for example. True, they are so, but few now give so great ones. My barge stays. Your lordship shall along come, good Sir Thomas. We shall be late else, which I would not be, for I was spoke to with Sir Henry Guildford this night to be comptroller. I am your lordship's. <laughs> None here, he hopes, in all this noble bevy has brought with her one care abroad. He would have all as merry as first good company, good wine, good welcome, can make good people. <laughs> oh, my lord, you're tardy. The very thought of this fair company clapped wings to me. You are young, Sir Harry Guildford. Sir Thomas Lovell had the cardinal but half my lay thoughts in him. Some of these should find a running banquet ere they rested. I think would better please them. By my life, they are a sweet society of fair ones. Oh, if your lordship were but now confessor to one or two of these. Oh, I would I were. They should find easy penance. Say how easy? As easy as a down bed would afford it. Sweet ladies, will please you sit, Sir Harry. Place you that side, I'll take the charge of this. His grace is entering. Nay, you must not freeze. Two women placed together makes cold weather. <laughs> My Lord Sant, you are one will keep them waking. Pray, sit between these ladies. Oh, by my faith, and thank your lordship. By your leave, sweet ladies. <laughs> if I chance to talk a little wild, forgive me. I had it from my father. Was he mad, sir? Oh, very mad. Exceeding mad in love, too. But he would bite none, just as I do now. He would kiss you twenty with a breath. <laughs> Well said, my lord. So now you're fairly seated. Gentlemen, the penance lies on you if these fair ladies pass away frowning. For my little cure, let me alone. <laughs> guests. That noble lady or gentleman that is not freely merry is not my friend. <laughs> this to confirm my welcome and to you all. Good health. <laughs> you 
your grace is noble. Let me have such a bowl may hold my thanks and save me so much talking. My Lord Sands, I'm beholding to you. Cheer your neighbours. Ladies, you're not merry. Gentlemen, whose fault is this? <laughs> the red wine first must rise in their fair cheeks, my lord. <laughs> then we shall have them talk us to silence. Yes. <laughs> you are a merry gamester, my lord Sands. Yes, if I make my play. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your ladyship, and pledge it, madam, for tis to such a thing... You cannot show me. Oh, I, I told your grace they would talk anon. <laughs> oh! What's that? Look out there, some of ye. What warlike voice and to what end is this? Nay, ladies, fear not. By all the laws of war, you're privileged. <laughs> How now, what is it? A noble troop of strangers, for so they seem. Hmm? They have left their barge and landed, and hither make as great ambassadors from foreign princes. Good Lord Chamberlain, go give them welcome. You can speak the French tongue, and pray receive them nobly and conduct them into our presence, where this heaven of beauty shall shine at full upon them. Some attend him. You have now a broken banquet, but we'll mend it. A good digestion to you all, and once more I shower a welcome on you. Welcome all! Ah! A noble company. What are their pleasures? Because they speak no English. <laughs> Thus they prayed to tell your grace that having heard by fame of this so noble and so fair assembly this night to meet here, they could do no less out of the great respect they bear to beauty, but leave their flocks and, under your fair conduct, crave leave to view these ladies and entreat an hour of revels with them. Say, Lord Chamberlain, they have done my poor house grace, for which I pay them a thousand thanks and pray them take their pleasures. <laughs> the fairest hand I ever touched. My lord. Oh, beauty. Till now I never knew me. <laughs> Tell them thus much from me. There should be one amongst them, by his person, more worthy this place than myself, to whom, if I but knew him, <laughs> with my love and duty, I would surrender it. I will, my lord. And what say they? Such a one they all confess there is indeed, which they would have your grace find out, and he will take it. Let me see, then. By all your good leaves, gentlemen. Here, I'll make my royal choice. You have found him! You hold a fair assembly. You do well, Lord. You are a churchman, or I'll tell you, Cardinal, I shall judge now unhappily. I'm glad your grace has grown so pleasant. <laughs> my Lord Chamberlain, prithee come hither. What fair lady is that? And please, Your Grace, Sir Thomas Bullen's daughter, the Viscount Rochford, one of her highness women. Oh, well, heaven, she's a dainty one. Sweetheart, I were unmannerly to take you out and not to kiss you. Oh. <laughs> Our health, gentlemen! Let it go round! <laughs> Sir Thomas Lovell. Is the banquet ready in the privy chamber? Yes, my lord. Your grace, I fear, with dancing is a little heat. <laughs> I fear too much. There's fresher air, my lord, in the next chamber. Lead in, your ladies, everyone. <laughs> Sweet partner, I must not yet forsake you. <laughs> Let's be merry. Good, my lord cardinal. I have half a dozen healths to drink to these fair ladies and a measure to lead them once again. <laughs> and then let's dream who's best in favor. <laughs> Let the music knock it! <laughs> Thank you.
We're away so fast. Oh, God save you. Even to the hall to hear what shall become of the great Duke of Buckingham. I'll save you that labour, sir. All's now done but the ceremony of bringing back the prisoner. Were you there? Yes, indeed, was I. Pray speak, what has happened? You may guess quickly, what? Is he found guilty? Yes, truly is he, and condemned upon. I am sorry for it. So are a number more. But pray, how passed it? I'll tell you in a little. The great Duke came to the bar, where to his accusations he pleaded still not guilty, and alleged many sharp reasons to defeat the law. The king's attorney, on the contrary, urged on the examinations, proofs, confessions of diverse witnesses, which the duke desired to have brought viva voce to his face, at which appeared against him his surveyor, Sir Gilbert Perk, his chancellor, and John Carr, confessor to him, with that devil monk Hopkins that made this mischief. That was he that fed him with his prophecies. The same. All these accused him strongly, which he fain would have flung from him, but indeed he could not. And so his peers, upon this evidence, have found him guilty of high treason. Much he spoke, and learnedly, for life. But all was either pitied in him, or forgotten. After all this, how did he bear himself? When he was brought again to the bar, to hear his knell rung out, his judgment, he was stirred with such an agony, he sweat extremely, and something spoke in choler, ill and hasty. But he fell to himself again, and sweetly, in all the rest, showed a most noble patience. I do not think he fears death. Sure he does not. He never was so womanish. The cause he may a little grieve at. Certainly the cardinal is the end of this. Tis likely, by all conjectures. First Kildare's attendier, then deputy of Ireland, who removed, Earl Surrey was sent thither, and in haste too, lest he should help his father. That trick of state was a deep, envious one. At his return, no doubt he will requite it. This is noted, and generally, whoever the king favours, the cardinal instantly will find employment, and far enough from court too. All the commons hate him perniciously, and of my conscience wish him ten fathom deep. This duke, as much they love and dote on, call him bounteous Buckingham, the mirror of all courtesy. Stay there, sir, and see the noble ruined man you speak of. Let's stand close and behold him. All good people, you that thus far have come to pity me, hear what I say, and then go home and lose me. I have this day received a traitor's judgment, and by that name must die. Yet heaven bear witness, and if I have a conscience, let it sink me, even as the axe falls, if I be not faithful. The law, I bear no malice for my death, has done upon the premises but justice. But those that sought it, I could wish more Christians. Be what they will, I heartily forgive them. Yet let them look their glory not in mischief, nor build their evils on the graves of great men. For then my guiltless blood must cry against them. For further life in this world I ne'er hope, nor will I sue, although the king have mercies more than I dare make faults. You few that loved me, and dare be bold to weep for Buckingham, his noble friends and fellows whom to leave is only bitter to him, only dying. Go with me like good angels to my end, and as the long divorce of steel falls on me, make of your prayers one sweet sacrifice, and lift my soul to heaven. Lead on, a God's name. I do beseech your grace, for charity. If ever any malice in your heart were hid against me, now to forgive me frankly. Sir Thomas Lovell, I as free forgive you as I would be forgiven. I forgive all. There cannot be those numberless offences against me that I cannot take peace with. No black envy shall mark my grave. Commend me to his grace. And if he speak of Buckingham, pray tell him. You met him half in heaven. My vows and prayers yet are the king's, and till my soul forsake shall cry for blessings on him. May he live longer than I have time to tell his years. Ever beloved and loving may his rule be. And when old time shall lead him to his end, goodness and he fill up one monument. To the waterside I must conduct your grace. Then give my charge up to Sir Nicholas Vaux, who undertakes you to your end. Prepare there, the Duke is coming. 
See the barge be ready and fitted with such furniture as suits the greatness of his person. Nay, Sir Nicholas, let it alone. My state now will but mock me. When I came hither, I was Lord High Constable and Duke of Buckingham. Now, poor Edward Bowen. Yet I am richer than my base accusers that never knew what truth meant. I now seal it, and with that blood will make them one day groan for it. My noble father, Henry of Buckingham, who first raised head against usurping Richard, flying for succor to his servant Bannister, being distressed, was by that wretch betrayed, and without trial fell. God's peace be with him. Henry the Seventh, succeeding, truly pitying my father's loss like a most royal prince, restored me to my honors, and out of ruins made my name once more noble. Now his son, Henry the Eighth, life, honor, name, and all that made me happy, at one stroke has taken forever from the world. I had my trial, and must needs say, a noble one which makes me a little happier than my wretched father. Yet thus far we are one in fortunes, both fell by our servants, by those men we loved most, a most unnatural and faithless service. Heaven has an end in all, yet you that hear me, this from a dying man, receive a certain. Where you are liberal of your loves and counsels, be sure you be not loose. For those you make friends and give your hearts to, when they once perceive the least rub in your fortunes, fall away like water from ye, never found again but where they mean to sink ye. All good people, pray for me. I must now forsake ye, the last hour of my long weary life is come upon me. Farewell. And when you would say something that is sad, speak how I fell. I have done. And God forgive me. Oh, this is full of pity. Sir, it calls, I fear, too many curses on their heads that were the authors. If the Duke be guiltless, tis full of woe. Yet I can give you inkling of an ensuing evil, if it fall, greater than this. Good angels, keep it from us. What may it be? You do not doubt my faith, sir. This secret is so weighty, it will require a strong faith to conceal it. Let me have it. I do not talk much. I am confident. You shall, sir. Did you not of late days hear a buzzing of a separation between the king and Catherine? Yes, but it held not. When the king once heard it out of anger, he sent command to the Lord Mayor straight to stop the rumour and allay those tongues that durst disperse it. But that slander, sir, is found a truth now, for it grows again fresher than e'er it was, and held for certain the king will venture at it. Either the cardinal or some about him near have, out of malice, to the good queen possessed him with a scruple that will undo her. To confirm this, too, Cardinal Campeus is arrived, and lately, as all think, for this business. Tis the cardinal and merely to revenge him on the Emperor for not bestowing on him at his asking the Archbishopric of Toledo this is purposed. I think you have hit the mark. But it's not cruel that she should feel the smart of this. The Cardinal will have his will, and she must fall. It is woeful. We are too open here to argue this. Let's think in private more. My lord, the horses your lordship sent for, with all the care I had, I saw well chosen, ridden, and furnished. They were young and handsome, and of the best breed in the north. When they were ready to set out for London, a man of my lord cardinal's, by commission and main power, took them from me, with this reason. His master would be served before a subject, if not before the king, which stopped our mouths, sir. Oh, I fear he will indeed. Well, 
let him have them. He will have all, I think. Well met, my Lord Chamberlain. Good day to both your graces. How is the king employed? I left him private, full of sad thoughts and troubles. What's the cause? It seems the marriage with his brother's wife has crept too near his conscience. No, his conscience has crept too near another lady. Yes, so. This is the cardinal's doing. The king cardinal, that blind priest, like the eldest son of fortune, turns what he list. The king will know him one day. Pray God he do. He'll never know himself else. How holily he works in all his business, and with what zeal. For now he has cracked the league between us and the emperor, the queen's great nephew, he dives into the king's soul. And there scatters dangers, doubts, ringing of the conscience, fears, and despairs, and all these for his marriage. And out of all these, to restore the king, he counsels a divorce, a loss of her that, like a jewel, has hung twenty years about his neck, yet never lost her luster. Of her that loves him with that excellence that angels love good men with, even of her, that when the greatest stroke of fortune falls, will bless the king. And is not this cause pious? Heaven keep me from such counsel. Tis most true, these news are everywhere. Every tongue speaks them, and every true heart weeps for it. All that dare look into these affairs see this main end, the French king's sister. Heaven will one day open the king's eyes that so long have slept upon this bold, bad man. And free us from his slavery. We had need pray, and heartily for our deliverance, or this imperious man will work us all from princes into pages. All men's honours lie like one lump before him, to be fashioned into what pitch he please. For me, my lords, I love him not, nor fear him. There's my creed. As I am made without him, so I'll stand, if the king please. His curses and his blessings touch me alike, their breath I not believe in. I knew him and I know him, so I leave him to him that made him proud, the Pope. Let's in, and with some other business put the king from these sad thoughts that work too much upon him. My lord, you bear us company. Excuse me, the king has sent me otherwhere. Besides, you'll find a most unfit time to disturb him. Health to your lordships. Thanks, my good lord Chamberlain. How sad he looks. Sure, he is much afflicted. Who's there? Huh? Pray God he be not angry. Who's there, I say? How dare you thrust yourselves into my private meditations? Who am I? Huh? A gracious king that pardons all offences malice ne'er meant. Our breach of duty this way is business of estate, in which we come to know your royal pleasure. Ye are too bold. Go to, I'll make you know your times of business. Is this an hour for temporal affairs? Huh? <laughs> Who's there? My good Lord Cardinal, oh, my Wolsey, the quiet of my wounded conscience. Thou art a cure fit for a king. Cardinal Campaeus, your welcome, most learned reverend sir, into our kingdom, use us and it. Your grace. My good lord, have great care I be not found a talker. Sir, you cannot. I would, your grace, would give us but an hour of private conference. We are busy. Go! This priest has no pride in him. Not to speak of. I would not be so sick over his place. But this cannot continue. If it do, I'll venture one half at him. Aye, another. Your grace has given a precedent of wisdom above all princes in committing freely your scruple to the voice of Christendom. Who can be angry now? What envy reach you? The Spaniard, tied by blood and favour to her, must now confess, if they have any goodness, the trial just and noble. All the clerks, I mean the learned ones in Christian kingdoms, have their free voices. Rome, the nurse of judgment, invited by your noble self, hath sent one general tongue unto us, this good man, this just and learned priest, Cardinal Campeus, whom once more I present unto your highness. And once more in mine arms I bid him welcome, and thank the holy conclave for their loves. They have sent me such a man I would have wished for. Your grace must needs deserve all strangers' loves. You are so noble. To your highness' hand I tender my commission, by whose virtue the court of Rome, commanding you, my lord Cardinal of York, are joined with me, their servant, in the unpartial judging of this business. Two equal men. The Queen shall be acquainted forthwith for what you come. Where's Gardner? I know your Majesty has always loved her so dear in heart 
Not to deny her that a woman of less place might ask by law. Scholars allowed freely to argue for her. Aye, and the best she shall have, and my favour to him that does best, God forbid else. Cardinal, prithee, call Gardiner to me, my new secretary. I find him a fit fellow. Give me your hand. Much joy and favour to you. You are the king's now. But to be commanded for ever by your grace, whose hand has raised me? Come hither, Gardiner. My lord of York, was not one Dr. Pace in this man's place before him? Yes, he was. Was he not held a learned man? <laughs> yes, surely. Believe me, there's an ill opinion spread then, even of yourself, Lord Cardinal. How? Of me? They will not stick to say you envied him. And fearing he would rise, he was so virtuous. Kept him a foreign man still, which so grieved him that he ran mad and died. Heaven's peace be with him. That's Christian care enough. For living murmurers, there's places of rebuke. He was a fool, for he would needs be virtuous. That good fellow, if I command him, follows my appointment. I will have none so near else. Learn this, brother. We live not to be griped by meaner persons. Deliver this with modesty to the queen. My liege. The most convenient place that I can think of for such receipt of learning is Black Friars. There ye shall meet about this weighty business. My Wolsey see it furnished. Oh, my lord, would it not grieve an able man to leave so sweet a bedfellow? But conscience, conscience, oh, tis a tender place, and I must leave her. Neither. Here's the pang that pinches. His Highness having lived so long with her, and she so good a lady that no tongue could ever pronounce dishonour of her. By my life, she never knew harm doing. Oh, now after so many courses of the sun enthroned, still growing in a majesty and pomp, the which to leave a thousandfold more bitter than tis sweet at first to acquire, after this process, to give her the avaunt, it is a pity would move a monster. Oh, hearts of most hard temper melt and lament for her. Oh, God's will, much better. She ne'er had known pomp. Mm. Though it be temporal, yet if that quarrel, fortune, do divorce it from the bearer, tis a sufferance panging as soul and body's severing. Alas, poor lady, she's a stranger now again. And so much the more must pity drop upon her. Verily, I swear, tis better to be lowly born, and range with humble livers in content, than to be perked up in a glistering grief and wear a golden sorrow. Our content is our best having. By my troth and maidenhead, I would not be a queen. Beshrew me, I would. And venture maidenhead <sighs> fought. Well, and so would you, for all this spice of your hypocrisy. You that have so fair parts of women on you have too a woman's heart, which ever yet affected eminence, wealth, sovereignty, which to say sooth our blessings, and which gifts, saving your mincing, the capacity of your soft, chevral conscience would receive if you might please to stretch it. Nay, good troth. Yes, troth and troth. You would not be a queen? No. Not for all the riches under heaven. Tis strange. A threatened bode would hire me, old as I am, to queen it. But I pray you, <sighs> what think you of a duchess? Have you limbs to bear that load of title? No, in truth. Then you are weakly made. Pluck off a little. I would not be a young count in your way for more than blushing comes to. If your back cannot vouchsafe this burden, tis too weak ever to get aboard. How you do talk. 
I swear again, I would not be a queen for all the world. In faith, for little England, you'd venture an emballing. <gasps> I myself would for Carnarvonshire, although they longed no more to the crown but that. Lo, who comes here? Good morrow, ladies. What were it worth to know the secret of your conference? My good lord, not your demand. It values not your asking. <sighs> Our mistress sorrows we were pitying. It was a gentle business, and becoming the action of good women. There is hope. All will be well. Now I pray God, amen. You bear a gentle mind, and heavenly blessings follow such creatures, that you may, fair lady, perceive I speak sincerely, and high notes turn of your many virtues, the king's majesty commends his good opinion of you, and does purpose honour to you no less flowing than Marchioness of Pembroke, to which title oh. a thousand pound a year annual support oh. out of his grace he adds. I do not know what kind of my obedience I should tender. More than my all is nothing, nor my prayers are not words duly hallowed, nor my wishes more worth than empty vanities. Yet prayers and wishes are all I can return. Beseech your lordship, vouchsafe to speak my thanks and my obedience as from a blushing handmaid to his highness, whose health and royalty I pray for. Lady, I shall not fail to prove the fair conceit the king hath of you. I have perused her well. Beauty and honour in her are so mingled that they have caught the king, and who knows yet, but from this lady may proceed a gem to lighten all this isle. I'll to the king and say I spoke with you. My honoured lord. Why, this it is. See, see, oh, I have been begging sixteen years in court. I'm yet a courtier beggarly, nor could come pat betwixt too early and too late for any suit of pounds. And you, oh, fate, a very fresh fish here. Fie, fie, fie upon this compelled fortune. Have your mouth filled up before you open it? This is strange to me. How tastes it? Is it bitter? Forty pence, no. <laughs> there was a lady once, tis an old story, that would not be a queen, that would she not for all the mud in Egypt. Have you heard it? Come, you were pleasant. And with your theme, I could o'ermount the lark, the marchioness of Pembroke, a thousand pounds a year for pure respect, no other obligation. By my life, that promises mo thousands. Honor's train is longer than his foreskirt. By this time I know your back will bear a duchess. <sighs> Say, are you not stronger than you were? Good lady, make yourself mirth with your particular fancy and leave me out, aunt. Would I had no being if this salute my blood a jot? It faints me to think what follows. The queen is comfortless, and we forgetful in our long absence. Pray do not deliver what here you have heard to her. Do you think me? Enter two verges with short silver wands. Next them, two scribes in the habit of doctors. After them, the Archbishop of Canterbury alone. After him, the bishops of Lincoln, Ely, Rochester, and St. Asaph. Next them, with some small distance, follows a gentleman bearing the purse with the great seal and the cardinal's hat. Then two priests bearing each a silver cross. Then Griffith, a gentleman usher, bareheaded, accompanied with a sergeant at arms bearing a silver mace. Then two gentlemen bearing two great silver pillars. After them, side by side, the two cardinals. Two noblemen with the sword and mace. The king takes place under the cloth of state. The two cardinals sit under him as judges. The queen takes place some distance from the king. The bishops place themselves on each side the court in manner of a consistory. Below them, the scribes. The lords sit next the bishops. The rest of the attendants stand in convenient order about the stage.
Whilst our commission from Rome is read, let silence be commanded. What's the need? It hath already publicly been read, and on all sides the authority allowed. You may then spare that time. Be it so. Proceed. Say, Henry, King of England, come into the court. Henry, King of England, come into the court. Here. Say, Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. Sir, I desire you do me right and justice, and to bestow your pity on me, for I am a most poor woman and a stranger, born out of your dominions, having here no judge indifferent, nor no more assurance of equal friendship and proceeding. Alas, sir, in what have I offended you? What cause has my behavior given to your displeasure, that thus you should proceed to put me off and take your good grace from me? Heaven witness, I have been to you a true and humble wife, at all times to your will conformable, even in fear to kindle your dislike, yea, subject to your countenance, glad or sorry, as I saw it inclined. When was the hour I ever contradicted your desire or made it not mine too? Or which of your friends have I not strove to love, although I knew he were mine enemy? What friend of mine that had to him derived your anger did I continue in my liking? Nay, gave notice he was from thence discharged. Sir, Call to mind that I have been your wife in this obedience upward of twenty years and have been blessed with many children by you. If in the course and process of this time you can report and prove it too against mine honor aught, my bond to wedlock or my love and duty against your sacred person, in God's name, turn me away, and let the foulest contempt shut door upon me, and so give me up to the shaft's kind of justice. Please you, sir. The king, your father, was reputed for a prince most prudent, of an excellent and unmatched wit and judgment. Ferdinand, my father, king of Spain, was reckoned one the wisest prince that there had reigned by many a year before. It is not to be questioned that they had gathered a wise counsel to them of every realm that did debate this business, who deemed our marriage lawful. Wherefore, I humbly beseech you, sir, to spare me, till I may be by my friends in Spain advised whose counsel I will implore. If not, in the name of God, your pleasure be fulfilled. You have here, lady, and of your choice, these reverend fathers, men of singular integrity and learning, yea, the elect of the land, who are assembled to plead your cause. It shall be therefore bootless that longer you desire the court, as well for your own quiet as to rectify what is unsettled in the king. His grace hath spoken well and justly. Therefore, madam, it's fit this royal session to proceed, and that without delay their arguments be now produced and heard. Lord Cardinal, to you I speak. Your pleasure, madam. Sir, I am about to weep, but thinking that we are a queen, or long have dreamed so, certain the daughter of a king, my drops of tears I'll turn to sparks of fire. Be patient yet. I will, when you are humble. Nay, before, or God will punish me. I do believe, induced by potent circumstances, that you are mine enemy. And make my challenge, you shall not be my judge. For it is you have blown this coal betwixt my lord and me, which gods do quench. Therefore I say again, I 
utterly abhor, yea, from my soul, refuse you for my judge, whom yet once more I hold my most malicious foe, and think not at all a friend to truth. I do profess you speak not like yourself. Whoever yet hath stood to charity and displayed the effects of disposition gentle and of wisdom or topping woman's power. Madam, you do me wrong. I have no spleen against you, nor injustice for you or any. How far I have proceeded, or how far further shall, is warranted by a commission from the consistory, yea, the whole consistory of Rome. You charge me that I have blown this coal. I do deny it. The king is present. If it be known to him that I gainsay my deed, how may he wound, and worthily, my falsehood? Yea, as much as you have done my truth. If he know that I am free of your report, he knows I am not of your wrong. Therefore in him it lies to cure me, and the cure is to remove these thoughts from you, the which before his highness shall speak in, I do beseech you, gracious madam, to unthink your speaking, and to say so no more. My lord, my lord, I am a simple woman, much too weak to oppose your cunning. You are meek and humble-mouthed. You sign your place and calling in full seeming with meekness and humility, but your heart is crammed with arrogancy, spleen, and pride. You have, by fortune and his highness favours, gone slightly o'er low steps, and now are mounted where powers are your retainers, and your words, domestics to you, serve your will as please yourself pronounce their office. I must tell you, you tender more your person's honour than your high profession spiritual that again I do refuse you for my judge. And here, before you all, appeal unto the Pope to bring my whole cause for his holiness and to be judged by him. The Queen is obstinate, stubborn to justice, apt to accuse it, and disdainful to be tried by it. Tis not well. She's going away. Call her again. Catherine, Queen of England, come into the court. Madam, you are called back. What need you notice? Pray you keep your way. When you are called, return. Now the Lord help. They vex me past my patience. Pray you pass on. I will not tarry. No, nor evermore upon this business my appearance make in any of their courts. Go thy ways, Kate. That man of the world who shall report he has a better wife, let him in naught be trusted for speaking false in that. Thou art alone, if thy rare qualities, sweet gentleness, thy meekness, saint-like, wife-like, government, obeying, in commanding, and thy parts, sovereign and pious, else could speak thee out, the queen of earthly queens. She's noble-born, and like her true nobility, she has carried herself towards me. Most gracious sir, in humblest manner, I require, Your Highness, that it shall please you to declare in hearing of all these ears, for where I am robbed and bound, there must I be unloosed, although not there at once and fully satisfied, whether ever I did broach this business to Your Highness, or laid any scruple in your way which might induce you to the question on't, or ever have to you, but with thanks to God for such a royal lady, spake one the least word that might be to the prejudice of her present state or touch of her good person. My lord cardinal, I do excuse you. Yea, upon mine honour, I free you from it. You are not to be taught that you have many enemies that know not why they are so, but like to village curs bark when their fellows do by some of these the queen is put in anger, ye are excused. But will you be more justified? You ever have wished the sleeping of this business, never desired it to be stirred, but oft have hindered, oft, the passages made toward it. On my honour I speak my good Lord Cardinal to this point, and thus far clear him. Now, what moved me to it? I will be bold with time and your attention. Then mark the inducement. Thus it came. Give heed to it. My 
conscience, first received a tenderness, scruple, and prick on certain speeches uttered by the Bishop of Bayonne, then French ambassador, who had been hither sent on the debating a marriage twixt the Duke of Orleans and our daughter Mary. In the progress of this business, ere a determinate resolution, he, I mean the bishop, did require a respite, wherein he might the king his lord advertise whether our daughter were legitimate, respecting this our marriage with the dowager, sometimes our brother's wife. This respite shook the bosom of my conscience, entered me, yea, with a spitting power, and made to tremble the region of my breast, which forced such way that many mazed considerings did throng and pressed in with this caution. First, methought I stood not in the smile of heaven, who had commanded nature that my lady's womb, if it conceived a male child by me, should do no more offices of life to t than... The grave does to the dead, for her male issue, or died where they were made, or shortly after this world had aired them. Hence I took a thought this was a judgment on me, that my kingdom, well worthy the best heir of the world, should not be gladded in by me. Then follows that I weighed the danger which my realms stood in, by this my issues fail, and that gave to me many a groaning throw. Thus, howling in the wild sea of my conscience, I did steer toward this remedy whereupon we are now present here together, that's to say, I meant to rectify my conscience, which I then did feel full sick and yet not well by all the reverend fathers of the land and doctors learned. First I began in private with you, my lord of Lincoln. You remember how under my oppression I did reek when I first moved you? Very well, my liege. I have spoke long. Be pleased yourself to say how far you satisfied me. So please, your highness, the question did at first so stagger me, bearing a state of mighty moment in and consequence of dread, that I committed the daringst counsel which I had to doubt, and did entreat your highness to this course which you are running here. I then moved you, my lord of Canterbury, and got your leave to make this present summons. Unsolicited, I left no reverend person in this court, but by particular consent proceeded under your hands and seals. Therefore, go on. For no dislike in the world against the person of the good queen, but the sharp, thorny points of my alleged reasons drives this forward. Prove but our marriage lawful. By my life and kingly dignity, we are contented to wear our mortal state to come with her, Catherine, our queen, before the primest creature that's paragoned of the world. So please, your highness, the queen being absent, tis a needful fitness that we adjourn this court till further day. Meanwhile, must be an earnest motion made to the Queen to call back her appeal she intends unto His Holiness. I may perceive these cardinals trifle with me. I abhor this dilatory sloth and tricks of Rome. My learned and well-beloved servant Cranmer, prithee return. With my approach I know my comfort comes along. Break up the court! I say, set on! Take thy lute, wench. My soul grows sad with troubles. Sing, and disperse them if thou canst. Leave working. Thank you. 
Please, Your Grace, the two great cardinals wait in the presence. Would they speak with me? They will be so, so, madam. Pray their graces to come near. What can be their business with me? A poor, weak woman, fallen from favor. I do not like their coming, now I think on't. They should be good men, their affairs as righteous. But all hoods make not monks. Peace to your highness. Your graces find me here part of a housewife. I would be all against the worst may happen. What are your pleasures with me, reverend lords? May it please you, noble madam, to withdraw into your private chamber. We shall give you the full cause of our coming. Speak it here. There's nothing I have done yet of my conscience deserves a corner. Would all other women could speak this with as free a soul as I do? My lords, I care not. So much I am happy above a number. If my actions were tried by every tongue, every eye saw them, envy and base opinion set against them. I know my life so even. If your business seek me out in that way, I am wife in. Out with it boldly. Truth loves open dealing. Tanta est ergate mentis integritas. Regina Serenissima? Oh, good, my lord. No Latin. I am not such a truant since my coming as not to know the language I have lived in. A strange tongue makes my cause more strange. Suspicious? Pray, speak in English. Here are some will thank you if you speak truth for their poor mistress' sake. Believe me, she has had much wrong. Lord Cardinal... The willingest sin I ever yet committed may be absolved in English. Noble lady, I am sorry my integrity should breed, and service to his majesty and you, so deep suspicion where all faith was meant. We come not by the way of accusation to taint that honor every good tongue blesses, nor to betray you any way to sorrow. You have too much, good lady. But to know... How you stand minded in the weighty difference between the king and you, and to deliver, like free and honest men, our just opinions and comforts to your cause. Most honoured, madam. My lord of York, out of his noble nature, zeal and obedience, he still bore your grace, forgetting, like a good man, your late censure, both of his truth and him, which was too far, offers, as I do, in a sign of peace, his service and his counsel. To betray me... My lords, I thank you both for your good wills. Ye speak like honest men. Pray God ye prove so. But how to make ye suddenly an answer in such a point of weight so near mine honour, more near my life, I fear, with my weak wit, and to such men of gravity and learning? In truth, I know not. I was set at work among my maids, full little, God knows, looking either for such men or such business. For her sake that I have been, for I feel the last fit of my greatness. Good, your graces, let me have time and counsel for my cause. Alas, I am a woman, friendless. 
hopeless. Madam, you wrong the king's love with these fears. Your hopes and friends are infinite. In England? But little for my profit. Can you think, lords, that any Englishman dare give me counsel or be a known friend against his highness' pleasure, though he be grown so desperate to be honest and live as subject? Nay, forsooth! My friends, they that must weigh out my afflictions, they that my trust must grow to, live not here. They are, as all my other comforts, far hence in mine own country, lords. I would your grace would leave your griefs and take my counsel. How, sir? Put your main cause into the king's protection. He's loving and most gracious. To be much both for your honor, better, and your cause. For if the trial of the law overtake ye, ye'll part away disgraced. He tells you rightly. Ye tell me what ye wish for both. My ruin. Is this your Christian counsel? Out upon ye. Heaven is above all yet. There sits a judge that no king can corrupt. Your rage mistakes us. The more shame for ye. Holy men, I thought ye, upon my soul, to reverend cardinal virtues. But cardinal sins and hollow hearts, I fear ye. Mend them for shame, my lords. Is this your comfort? The cordial that ye bring a wretched lady? A woman lost among ye? Laughed at? Scorned? I will not wish ye half my miseries. I have more charity. But say I warn ye. Take heed. For heaven's sake, take heed. Lest at once the burden of my sorrows fall upon ye. Madam, this is a mere distraction. You turn the good we offer into envy. Ye turn me into nothing. Woe upon ye, and all such false professors! Would you have me, if you have any justice, any pity, if ye be anything but churchmen's habits, put my sick cause into his hands that hates me? Alas, has banished me his bed already, his love too, long ago. I am old, my lords. And all the fellowship I hold now with him is only my obedience. What can happen to me above this wretchedness? All your studies make me accursed like this. Your fears are worse. Have I lived thus long? Let me speak myself, since virtue finds no friends. A wife? A true one? A woman, I dare say, without vainglory, never yet branded with suspicion? Have I... With all my full affection, still met the king, loved him next heaven, obeyed him, been out of fondness superstitious to him, almost forgot my prayers to content him, and am I thus rewarded? Tis not well, lords. Bring me a constant woman to her husband, one that ne'er dreamed a joy beyond his pleasure. And to that woman, when she has done most, yet will I add an honour. A great patience! Madam, you wonder from the good we aim at. My lord, I dare not make myself so guilty to give up willingly that noble title your master wed me to. Nothing but... Death shall e'er divorce my dignity. Pray hear me. Would I had never trod this English earth, or felt the flatteries that grow upon it. Ye have angels' faces, but heaven knows your hearts. What will become of me now, wretched lady? I am the most unhappy woman living. Alas, poor wenches, where are now your fortunes? Shipwrecked upon a kingdom where no pity, no friends, no hope, no kindred weep for me. Almost no grave allowed me. Like the lily that once was mistress of the field and flourished, I'll hang my head and perish. <sighs> If your grace could but be brought to know our ends are honest, you'd feel more comfort. 
Why should we, good lady, upon what cause wrong you? Alas, our places, the way of our profession, is against it. We are to cure such sorrows, not to sow them. For goodness sake, consider what you do, how you may hurt yourself. I utterly grow from the king's acquaintance by this carriage. The hearts of princes kiss obedience, so much they love it. But to stubborn spirits, they swell and grow as terrible as storms. I know you have a gentle, noble temper, a soul as even as a calm. Pray think us those we profess, peacemakers, friends, and servants. Madam, you'll find it so. You wronged your virtues with these weak women's fears. A noble spirit as yours was put into you, ever cast such doubts as false coin from it. The king loves you. Beware you lose it not. For us, if you please to trust us in your business, we are ready to use our utmost studies in your service. Do what ye will, my lords. And pray, forgive me, if I have used myself unmannerly. You know I am a woman, lacking wit to make a seemly answer to such persons. Pray, do my service to his majesty. He has my heart yet, and shall have my prayers while I shall have my life. Come, reverend fathers, bestow your counsels on me. She now begs the little thought when she set footing here. She should have bought her dignities so dear. If you will now unite in your complaints and force them with a constancy, the cardinal cannot stand under them. If you omit the offer of this time, I cannot promise but that you shall sustain mo new disgraces with these you bear already. I am joyful to meet the least occasion that may give me remembrance of my father-in-law, the duke, to be revenged on him. Which of the peers have uncontemned gone by him, or at least strangely neglected? Mm. When did he regard the stamp of nobleness in any person out of himself? My lords, you speak your pleasures. What he deserves of you and me, I know. What we can do to him, though now the time gives way to us, I much fear. If you cannot bar his access to the king, never attempt anything on him, for he hath a witchcraft over the king in his tongue. No, oh, fear him not. His spell in that is out. The king hath found matter against him that forever mars the honey of his language. No, he settled not to come off in his displeasure. Sir, I should be glad to hear such news as this once every hour. Believe it, this is true. In the divorce, his contrary proceedings are all unfolded, wherein he appears as I would wish mine enemy. Uh, how came his practices to light? Most strangely. Oh, how? How? The cardinal's letters to the pope miscarried, and came to thy the king, wherein was read how that the cardinal did entreat his holiness to stay the judgment of the divorce. For if it did take place, I do, quoth he, perceive, my king is tangled in affection to a creature of the queen's, Lady Anne Bullen. Has the king this? Believe it. Will this work? The king in this perceives him, how he coasts and hedges his own way. But in this point, all his tricks founder, and he brings his physic after his patient's death. The king already hath married the fair lady. <laughs> Would he had. May you be happy in your wish, my lord, for I profess you have it. Now all my joy trace the conjunction. My amen, Toot. All men's. There's order given for her coronation. Mary, this is yet but young, and may be left to some ears unrecounted. But, my lords, she is a gallant creature, and complete in mind and feature. I persuade me from her will fall some blessing to this land, which shall in it be memorized. But will the king digest this letter of the cardinals? I mean, the Lord forbid. Mary, amen. No, no. There be no wasps that buzz about his nose will make this sting the sooner. Cardinal Campeus is stolen away to Rome, hath taken no leave, has left the cause of the king unhandled, and is posted as the agent of our cardinal to second all his plot. I do assure you the king cried, ha, huh? at this. <laughs> now God incense him and let him cry, ha, huh? louder. <laughs> but, my lord, when returns Cram? He is returned in his opinions, which have satisfied the king for his divorce, together with all famous colleges almost in Christendom. 
Shortly, I believe, his second marriage shall be published, and her coronation. Catherine no more shall be called queen, but Princess Dowager, and widow to Prince Arthur. This same Cranmer is a worthy fellow, and hath attained much pain in the king's business. He has, and we shall see him for it an archbishop. So I hear. It is so. The cardinal. Observe, observe, his moody. Packet, Cromwell. Gave it to the king? To his own hand in his bedchamber. Looked he on the inside of the paper? Presently he did unseal them, and the first he viewed he did it with a serious mind. A heed was in his countenance. Mm -hmm. You he bade attend him here this morning. Is he ready to come abroad? I think by this he is. Leave me a while. It shall be to the Duchess of Alençon, the French king's sister. He shall marry her. Anne Bullen? No, oh, well, no Anne Bullens for him. There's more in than fair visage. Bullen? No. We are no Bullens. Speedily I wish to hear from Rome. The Marchioness of Pembroke. He's discontented. Maybe he hears the king does wet his anger to him. Sharp enough, Lord, for thy justice. The late queen's gentlewoman, a knight's daughter to be her mistress' mistress, the queen's queen. This candle burns not clear. Tis I must snuff it, then out it goes. What though I know her virtuous and well-deserving, yet I know her for a spleeny Lutheran, and not wholesome to our cause, that she should lie in the bosom of our hard-ruled king. Again there is sprung up an heretic, an arch-one, Cranmer. One hath crawled into the favour of the king, and is his oracle. He is vexed at something. Mm, I would to a something that would fret the string, the master cordon's heart. The king, the king. What piles of wealth hath he accumulated to his own portion? At what expense, by the hour, seems to flow from him? How, in the name of thrift, does he rake this together? Now, my lord, saw you the cardinal. My lord, we have stood here observing him. Some strange commotion is in his brain. He bites his lip and starts, stops on a sudden, looks upon the ground, then lays his finger on his temple, straight springs out into fast gait, then stops again, strikes his breast hard, and anon he casts his eye against the moon. In most strange postures we have seen him set himself. It may well be there is a mutiny in his mind. This morning, papers of state he sent me to peruse, as I required. And watch you what I found there, on my conscience put unwittingly, forsooth an inventory, thus importing the several parcels of his plate, his treasure, rich stuffs and ornaments of household, which I find at such proud rate that it outspeaks possession of a subject. It's heaven's will. Some spirit put this paper in the packet to bless your eye withal. If we did think his contemplation were above the earth and fixed on spiritual object, he should still dwell in his musings. But I'm afraid his thinkings are below the moon, not worth his serious considering. Uh, heaven forgive me. Ever God bless your highness. Good, my lord. You are full of heavenly stuff, and bear the inventory of your best graces in your mind, the which you were now running on. <laughs> you have scarce time to steal from spiritual leisure a brief span to keep your earthly audit. Sure, in that I deem you an ill husband, and am glad to have you there in my companion. Sir, for holy offices I have a time, a time to think upon the part of business which I bear in the state, and nature does require her times of preservation, which perforce I, her frail son, amongst my brethren mortal, must give my tendance to. You have said well. And ever may your highness yoke together, as I will lend you cause, my doing well with my well saying. Tis well said again, and tis a kind of good deed to say well, and yet words are no deeds. My father loved you, he said he did, and with his deed did crown his word upon you. Since I had my office, I have kept you next my heart, have not alone employed you where high profits might come home, but paired my present havings to bestow my bounties upon you. What should this mean? The Lord increase this business. Have I not made you the prime man of the state? I pray you tell me, if what I now pronounce you have found true, and if you may confess it, say with all, if you are bound to us or no, what say you? My sovereign, I confess your royal graces showered on me daily have been more than could my studied purposes requite which went beyond all man's endeavours. My endeavours have ever come too short of my desires, 
yet filled with my abilities. Mine own ends have been mine so that evermore they pointed to the good of your most sacred person and the profit of the state. For your great graces, heaped upon me, poor undeserver, I can nothing render but allegiant thanks, my prayers to heaven for you, my loyalty, which ever has and ever shall be growing, till death that winter kill it. Fairly answered. A loyal and obedient subject is therein illustrated. The honour of it does pay the act of it, as in the contrary, the foulness is the punishment. I presume that, as my hand has opened bounty to you, my heart dropped love, my power rained honour more on you than any. So your hand and heart, your brain, and every function of your power should, notwithstanding that, your bond of duty, as twere in love's particular, be more to me your friend than any. I do profess that for your highness could I ever laboured more than mine own. But am, have, and will be, though all the world should crack their duty to you and throw it from their soul, though perils did abound as thick as thought could make them and appear in forms more horrid. Yet my duty, as doth a rock against the chiding flood, should the approach of this wild river break and stand unshaken yours. Tis nobly spoken. Take notice, lords. He has a loyal breast, for you have seen him open it. Read all of this, and after this, and then to breakfast with what appetite you have. What should this mean? What sudden anger's this? How have I reaped it? He parted frowning from me as if ruin leapt from his eyes. So looks the chafed lion upon the daring huntsman that has galled him, then makes him nothing. I must read this paper. I fear in the story of his anger. Tis so. This paper has undone me. "'Tis the account of all that world of wealth I have drawn together for mine own ends, indeed to gain the popedom and fee my friends in Rome. Oh, negligence fit for a fool to fall by! What cross devil made me put this main secret in the packet I sent the king? Is there no way to cure this? No new device to beat this from his brains? I know it will stir him strongly. Yet I know a way, if it take right, in spite of fortune, will bring me off again. What's this? To the Pope. The letter, as I live, with all the business I writ to his holiness. Nay, then, farewell. I have touched the highest point of all my greatness. And from that full meridian of my glory, I haste now to my setting. I shall fall like a bright exhalation in the evening, and no man see me more. Here the king's pleasure, cardinal, who commands you to render up the great seal presently into our hands and to confine yourself to Asher House, my lord of Winchester's, till you hear further from his highness. Stay. Where's your commission, lords? Words cannot carry authority so weighty. Who dare cross him, bearing the king's will from his mouth expressly? Shall I find more than will or words to do it? I mean your malice. No officious lords, I dare and must deny it. How oh, I feel of what coarse metal ye are moulded. Envy. How eagerly ye follow my disgraces as if it fed ye, and how sleek and wanton ye appear in everything may bring my ruin. Follow your envious courses, men of malice. You have Christian warrant for them, and no doubt in time will find their fit rewards. That seal you ask with such a violence, the king, mine, and your master, with his own hand, gave me. Bade me enjoy it with the place and honours during my life, and to confirm his goodness, ties it by letters patents. Now, who'll take it? The king that gave it. It must be himself, then. Thou art a proud traitor, priest. Proud lord, thou liest. Within these forty hours, sorry durst better have burnt that tongue than said so. Thy ambition, thou scarlet sin, robbed this bewailing land of noble Buckingham, my father-in-law. 
the heads of all thy brother cardinals, with thee and all thy best parts bound together, weighed not a hair of his. Plague of your policy! You sent me deputy for Ireland, far from his succour, from the king, from all that might have mercy on the fault thou gavest him, whilst your great goodness, out of holy pity, absolved him with an axe. This and all else this talking lord can lay upon my credit, I answer, is most false. The duke by law found his deserts. How innocent I was from any private malice in his end, his noble jury and foul cause can witness. If I love many words, Lord, I should tell you, you have as little honesty as honour, that in the way of loyalty and truth toward the king, my ever royal master, dare mate a sounder man than Surrey can be, and all that love his follies. By my soul, your long coat priest protects you. Thou shouldst feel my sword in the lifeblood of the else. My lords, can ye endure to hear this arrogance? And from this fellow, if we live thus tamely, to be thus jaded by a piece of scarlet, farewell nobility, let his grace go forward and dare us with his cap like lark. All of goodness is poison to thy stomach. Yes, that goodness of gleaning all the land's wealth into one, into your own hands, cardinal, by extortion. The goodness of your intercepted packets you writ to the Pope against the King. Your goodness, since you provoke me, shall be most notorious. My Lord of Norfolk, as you are truly noble, as you respect the common good, the state of our despised nobility, our issues, who, if he live, will scarce be gentlemen, produce the grand sum of his sins, the articles collected from his life, I'll startle you worse than the sacring bell when the brown wench lay kissing in your arms, Lord Cardinal. How much methinks I could despise this man, but that I'm bound in charity against it. Those articles, my lord, are in the king's hand, but thus much they are foul ones. So much fairer and spotless shall mine innocence arise when the king knows my truth. <laughs> this cannot save you. I thank my memory. I yet remember some of these articles, and out they shall. Now... If you can blush and cry guilty, Cardinal, you'll show a little honesty. Speak on, sir. I dare your worst objections. If I blush, it is to see a nobleman want manners. <laughs> I'd rather want those than my head. Have at you. First, that without the king's assent or knowledge, you wrought to be a legate, by which power you maimed the jurisdiction of all bishops. Then that all you writ to Rome, or else to foreign princes, ego et rex meus was still inscribed, in which you brought the king to be your servant. Then, that without the knowledge either of king or council, when you went ambassador to the emperor, you made bold to carry into Flanders the great seal. Item. You sent a large commission to Gregory de Casado to conclude, without the king's will or the state's allowance, a league between his highness and Ferrara. That out of mere ambition you have caused your holy hat to be stamped on the king's coin. Then that you have sent innumerable substance, by what means God I leave to your own conscience, to furnish Rome and to prepare the ways you have for dignities to the mere undoing of all the kingdom. Many more there are, which since they are of you and odious, I will not taint my mouth with. Oh, my lord, press not a falling man too far. Tis virtue. His faults lie open to the laws. Let them, not you, correct him. My heart weeps to see him so little of his great self. I forgive him. <laughs> lord Cardinal, the king's further pleasure is... Because all those things you have done of late by your power legative within this kingdom fall into the compass of a premunir, that therefore such a writ be sued against you to forfeit all your goods, lands, tenements, chattels, and whatsoever, and to be out of the king's protection. This is my charge. And so we'll leave you to your meditations how to live better. For your stubborn answer about the giving back the great seal to us, the king shall know it, and no doubt shall thank you. So fare you well, my little good Lord Cardinal. So, farewell to the little good you bear me. Farewell. A long farewell to all my greatness. This is the state of man. Today he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes. Tomorrow blossoms and bears his blushing honours thick upon him. The third day comes a frost, 
a killing frost. And when he thinks, good easy man, full surely his greatness is a ripening, nips his root, and then he falls, as I do. I have ventured, like little wanton boys that swim on bladders, this many summers in a sea of glory, but far beyond my depth. My high-blown pride at length broke under me, and now has left me, weary and old with service, to the mercy of a rude stream that must forever hide me. Vain pomp and glory of this world, I hate she. I feel my heart new opened. Oh, how wretched is that poor man that hangs on princes' favours. There is, betwixt that smile we would aspire to, that sweet aspect of princes, and their ruin, more pangs and fears than wars or women have. And when he falls, he falls like Lucifer, never to hope again. Why, how now, Cromwell? I have no power to speak, sir. What, amazed at my misfortunes? Can thy spirit wonder a great man should decline? <coughs> Nay, and you weep, and fallen indeed. How does your grace? Why, well, never so truly happy, my good Cromwell. I know myself now, and I feel within me a peace above all earthly dignities, a still and quiet conscience. The king has cured me. I humbly thank his grace. And from these shoulders, these ruined pillars, out of pity taken a load would sink a navy. Too much honour. Oh, it is a burden, Cromwell. It is a burden too heavy for a man that hopes for heaven. I am glad your grace has made that right use of it. I hope I have. I am able now, methinks, out of a fortitude of soul, I feel, to endure more miseries and greater far than my weak-hearted enemies dare offer. What news abroad? The heaviest and the worst is your displeasure with the King. God bless him. The next is that Sir Thomas More is chosen Lord Chancellor in your place. That's somewhat sudden. But he's a learned man. May he continue long in his highness' favour, and do justice for truth's sake and his conscience, that his bones, when he has run his course and sleeps in blessings, may have a tomb of orphans' tears wept on him. What more? That Cranmer is returned with welcome, installed Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. That's news indeed. Last, that the Lady Anne, whom the King hath in secrecy long married, oh. this day was viewed in open as his Queen going mm. to chapel, and the voice is now only about her coronation. There was the weight that pulled me down. Oh, Cromwell, the King has gone beyond me. All my glories in that one woman I have lost forever. No son shall ever usher forth mine honours. Or gild again the noble troops that waited upon my smiles. Go, get thee from me, Cromwell. I am a poor fallen man, unworthy now to be thy lord and master. Seek the king, that son I pray may never set. I have told him what and how true thou art. He will advance thee. Some little memory of me will stir him. I know his noble nature, not to let thy hopeful service perish too. Good Cromwell, neglect him not. Make use now, and provide for thine own future safety. Oh, my lord, must I then leave you? Must I needs forgo so good, so noble, and so true a master? Bear witness, all that have not hearts of iron, with what a sorrow Cromwell leaves his lord. The king shall have my service, but my prayers for ever and for ever shall be yours. Cromwell, I did not think to shed a tear in all my miseries. But thou hast forced me, out of thy honest truth, 
to play the woman. Let's dry our eyes. And thus far, hear me, Cromwell, and when I am forgotten, as I shall be, and sleep in dull, cold marble, where no mention of me more must be heard of, say, I taught thee, say, Wolsey, that once trod the ways of glory, and sounded all the depths and shoals of honour, found thee a way out of his wreck to rise in, a sure and safe one, though thy master missed it. Mark but my fall, and that that ruined me. Cromwell, I charge thee, fling away ambition. By that sin fell the angels. How can man, then, the image of his Maker, hope to win by it? Love thyself last. Cherish those hearts that hate thee. Corruption wins not more than honesty. Still in my right hand carry gentle peace, to silence envious tongues. Be just, and fear not. Let all the ends thou aimst at be thy countries, thy gods, and truths. Then, if thou fallst, O Cromwell, thou fallst a blessed martyr. Serve the king, and prithee lead me in. There take an inventory of all I have to the last penny. Tis the king's. My robe and my integrity to heaven is all I dare now call mine own. O oh, Cromwell, Cromwell, had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies. Good sir, have patience. So I have. Farewell, the hopes of court. My hopes in heaven do dwell. You are well met once again. So are you. You come to take your stand here and behold the Lady Anne pass from her coronation? Tis all my business. At our last encounter, the Duke of Buckingham came from his trial. Tis very true, but that time offered sorrow. This, general joy. Tis well. The citizens, I am sure, have shown at full their royal minds, as, let them have their rights, they are ever forward, in celebration of this day with shows, pageants, and sights of honour. Never greater, nor, I'll assure you, better taken, sir. May I be bold to ask what that contains? That paper in your hand? Yes, tis the list of those that claim their offices this day, by custom of the coronation. The Duke of Suffolk is the first, and claims to be High Steward. Next, the Duke of Norfolk, he to be Earl Marshal. You may read the rest. I thank you, sir. Had I not known those customs, I should have been beholding to your paper. But, I beseech you, what's become of Catherine, the Princess Dowager? How goes her business? That I can tell you, too. The Archbishop of Canterbury, accompanied with other learned and reverend fathers of his order, held a late court at Dunstable, six miles off from Amphill, where the princess lay, to which she was often cited by them, but appeared not. And, to be short, for not appearance and the king's late scruple, by the main assent of all these learned men, she was divorced, and the late marriage made of none effect. Since which she was removed to Kimbolton, where she remains now sick. Alas, good lady. The trumpets sound. Stand close. The queen is coming. The Order of the Coronation. A lively flourish of trumpets. Then two judges. Lord Chancellor with purse and mace before him. Chorister singing, music. Mayor of London bearing the mace, then garter in his coat of arms, and on his head he wore a gilt copper crown. Marcus Dorset bearing a scepter of gold, on his head a demi coronal of gold. With him, the Earl of Surrey, bearing the rod of silver with the dove, crowned with an earl's coronet. Collars of S's. Duke of Suffolk, in his robe of estate, 
his coronet on his head, bearing a long white wand as high steward. With him, the Duke of Norfolk, with the rod of marshalship, a coronet on his head, collars of S's. A canopy borne by four of the cinq ports, under it the queen in her robe, in her hair richly adorned with pearl, crowned. On each side her, the bishops of London and Winchester. The old Duchess of Norfolk, in a coronal of gold, wrought with flowers bearing the queen's tray. Certain ladies or countesses with plain circlets of gold without flowers. A royal train, believe me. These I know. Who's that that bears the scepter? Marquis Dorset. And that the Earl of Surrey with the rod? A bold, brave gentleman. That should be the Duke of Suffolk. It is the same, High Steward. And that my Lord of Norfolk? Yes. Oh, the Queen. Heaven bless thee, thou hast the sweetest face I ever looked on. Sir, as I have a soul, she is an angel. Our King has all the Indies in his arms, and more and richer when he strains that lady. I cannot blame his conscience. They that bear the cloth of honour over her are four barons of the sink ports. Those men are happy, and so are all are near her. I take it she that carries up the train is that old noble lady Duchess of Norfolk? It is, and all the rest are countesses. Their coronets say so. These are stars indeed. And sometimes falling ones. No more of that. God save you, sir. Where have you been broiling? Among the crowd in the abbey, where a finger could not be wedged in more. I am stifled with the mere rankness of their joy. You saw the ceremony? That I did. How was it? Well worth the seeing. Good, sir. Speak it to us. As well as I am able. The rich stream of lords and ladies, having brought the queen to a prepared place in the choir, fell off a distance from her, while her grace sat down to rest a while some half an hour or so in a rich chair of state, opposing freely the beauty of her person to the people. Believe me, sir, she is the goodliest woman that ever lay by man, which, when the people had the full view of, such a noise arose as the shrouds make at sea in a stiff tempest, as loud and to as many tunes. <laughs> Hats, cloaks, doublets, I think, flew up, and had their faces been loose this day, they had been lost. Such joy I never saw before. Great bellied women that had not half a week to go, like rams in the old time of war, would shake the press and make them reel before them. No man living could say, This is my wife, there. All were woven so strangely in one piece. But what followed? At length, her grace rose and with modest paces came to the altar, where she kneeled and saint-like cast her fair eyes to heaven and prayed devoutly. Then rose again and bowed her to the people, when, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, she had all the royal makings of a queen as holy oil, Edward's confessor's crown, the rod and bird of peace, and all such emblems laid nobly on her, which performed the choir with all the choicest music of the kingdom together sung Te Deum. So she parted, and with the same full state paced back again to York Place, where the feast is held. Sir, you must no more call it York Place. That's past. For since the cardinal fell, that title's lost. It is now the king's, and called Whitehall. I know it. But tis so lately altered that the old name is fresh about me. What two reverend bishops were those that went on each side of the queen? Stokesley and Gardiner. The one of Winchester, newly preferred from the king's secretary, the other London. He of Winchester is held no great good lover of the archbishops, the virtuous Cramner. Well, all the land knows that. However, yet there is no great breach. When it comes, Cranmer will find a friend will not shrink from him. Who may that be, I pray you? Thomas Cromwell, a man in much esteem with the king and truly a worthy friend. The king has made him master of the jewel house and won already the privy council. He will deserve more. Yes, without all doubt. Come, gentlemen, he shall go my way, which is to the court, and there you shall be my guests. Something I can command. As I walk thither, I'll tell ye more. You may command us, sir.
How does your grace? Oh, Griffith, sick to death. My legs, like loaden branches, bow to the earth, willing to leave their burden. Reach your chair. So, now, methinks I feel a little ease. Didst thou not tell me, Griffith, as thou ledst me, that the great child of honour, Cardinal Woolsey, was dead? Yes, madam, but I think your grace, out of the pain you suffered, gave no ear to it. Prithee, good Griffith, tell me how he died. If well, he stepped before me happily for my example. Well, the voice goes, madam. For after the stout Earl Northumberland arrested him at York and brought him forward as a man sorely tainted to his answer, he fell sick suddenly and grew so ill he could not sit his mule. <laughs> Alas, poor man. At last, with easy roads, he came to Leicester, lodged in the abbey where the reverend abbot, with all his covenant, honourably received him, to whom he gave these words. O oh, Father Abbot, an old man broken with the storms of state is come to lay his weary bones among ye. Give him a little earth for charity. So went to bed where eagerly his sickness pursued him still, and three nights after this, after the hour of eight, which he himself foretold should be his last, full of repentance, continual meditations, tears, and sorrows, he gave his honours to the world again, his blessed part to heaven. And slept in peace. So may he rest, his faults lie gently on him. Yet thus far, Griffith, give me leave to speak him, and yet with charity. He was a man of an unbounded stomach, ever ranking himself with princes, one that by suggestion tied all the kingdom. Simony was fair play. His own opinion was his law. Is a presence he would say untruths, and be ever double both in his words and meaning. He was never, but where he meant to ruin, pitiful. His promises were, as he then was, mighty. But his performance, as he is now, nothing. Of his own body he was ill and gave the clergy ill example. Noble madam, men's evil manners live in brass, their virtues we write in water. May it please your highness to hear me speak his good now? Yes, good Griffith. I were malicious else. This cardinal, though from an humble stock, undoubtedly was fashioned to much honour. From his cradle he was a scholar, and a ripe and good one, exceeding wise, fair-spoken, and persuading, lofty and sour to them that loved him not, but to those men that sought him, sweet as summer. And though he were unsatisfied in getting, which was a sin, yet in bestowing, madam, he was most princely. Ever witness for him those twins of learning that he raised in you, Ipswich and Oxford, one of which fell with him, unwilling to outlive the good that did it, the other, though unfinished, yet so famous, so excellent in art, and still so rising, that Christendom shall ever speak his virtue. His overthrow heaped happiness upon him, for then, and not till then, he felt himself and found the blessedness of being little, and, to add greater honours to his age than man could give him, he died fearing God. After my death I wish no other herald, no other speaker of my living actions, to keep mine honour from corruption but such an honest chronicler as Griffith, <laughs> whom I most hated living, thou hast made me with thy religious truth and modesty, now in his ashes honour. Peace be with him. Patience, be near me still and set me lower. Madam. I have not long to trouble thee. Good Griffith, cause the musicians play me that sad note I named my knell. Whilst I sit meditating on that celestial harmony I go to. She is asleep. Good wench, let's sit down quiet for fear we wake her. Softly, gentle patience.
Oh, spirits of peace, where are ye? Are ye all gone and leave me here in wretchedness behind ye? Madam, we are here. It is not you I called for. Saw ye none enter since I slept? None, madam. No? Saw you not even now a blessed troop invite me to a banquet whose bright faces cast thousand beams upon me like the sun? They promised me eternal happiness and brought me garlands, Griffith, which I feel I am not worthy yet to wear. I shall, assuredly. I am most joyful, madam. Such good dreams possess your fancy. Bid the music leave. They are harsh and heavy to me. Do you note how much her grace is altered on the sudden? How long her face is drawn, how pale she looks, and of an earthly cold mark her eyes. She is going, wench. Pray, pray. Heaven comfort her. And like your grace. You are a saucy fellow. Deserve we no more reverence? You are to blame, knowing she will not lose her wanted greatness to you so rude behavior. Go to, kneel. I humbly do entreat your highness. Pardon, my haste made me unmannerly. There is staying a gentleman sent from the king to see you. Admit him entrance, Griffith. But this fellow... Let me ne'er see again. If my sight fail not, you should be Lord Ambassador from the Emperor, my royal nephew. And your name? Capucius. Madam, the same. Your servant. Oh, my lord. The times and titles now are altered strangely with me since first you knew me. But I pray you, what is your pleasure with me? Noble lady, first mine own service to your grace. The next the king's request that I would visit you, who grieves much for your weakness, and by me sends you his princely commendations, and heartily entreats you take good comfort. Oh, my good lord, that comfort comes too late. "'Tis like a pardon after execution. "'That gentle physic given in time had cured me. "'But now I am past all comforts here but prayers. "'How does his highness? Uh, "'Madam, in good health. "'So may he ever do, and ever flourish, "'when I shall dwell with worms, "'and my poor name banished the kingdom. "'Patience, is that letter I caused you write yet sent away? No, madam. Sir, I most humbly pray you to deliver this to my lord the king. Most willing, madam. In which I have commended to his goodness the model of our chaste loves, his young daughter. The dews of heaven fall sick in blessings on her, beseeching him to give her virtuous breeding. She is young, and of a noble, modest nature. I hope she will deserve well, and a little to love her for her mother's sake, that loved him, heaven knows how dearly. My next poor petition is that his noble grace would have some pity upon my wretched women, that so long have followed both my fortunes faithfully, of which there is not one I dare avow, and now I should not lie, but will deserve, for virtue and true beauty of the soul, for honesty and decent carriage, a right good husband. Let him be a noble, and sure those men are happy that shall have him. The last is for my men. They are the poorest, but poverty could never draw them from me. That they may have their wages duly paid them, and something over to remember me by. If heaven had pleased to have given me longer life and able means, we had not parted thus. These are the whole contents, and good my lord, by that you love the dearest in this world, as you wish Christian peace to souls departed, stand these poor people's friend, and urge the king to do me this last right. By heaven, I will, or let me lose the fashion of a man. I thank you, honest lord. Remember me 
in all humility unto his highness. Say, his long trouble now is passing out of this world. Tell him in death I blessed him, for so I will. Mine eyes grow dim. Farewell, my lord. Gracious, farewell. Nay, patience. Madam? You must not leave me yet. I must to bed. Call in more women. When I am dead, good wench, let me be used with honour. Strew me over with maiden flowers, that all the world may know I was a chaste wife to my grave. Embalm me, then lay me forth. Although unqueened, yet like a queen, and daughter to a king, inter me. I can no more. It's one o'clock, boy, is it not? It hath struck. These should be ours for necessities, not for delights. Times to repair our nature with comforting repose, and not for us to waste these times. Good hour of night, Sir Thomas, with us so late. Came you from the king, my lord? I did, Sir Thomas, and left him at Primero with the Duke of Suffolk. I must to him too before he go to bed. I'll take my leave. Not yet, Sir Thomas Lovell. But what's the matter? It seems you are in haste. And if there be no great offence belongs to it. Give your friend some touch of your late business. Affairs that walk, as they say spirits do, at midnight, have in them a wilder nature than the business that seeks dispatch by day. My lord, I love you, and durst commend a secret to your ear much weightier than this work. The queen's in labour, they say, in great extremity, and feared she'll with the labour end. The fruit she goes with, I pray for her today, that it may find good time and live. I... But for the stock, Sir Thomas, I wish it grubbed up now. Methinks I could cry the amen, and yet my conscience says she's a good creature, and, sweet lady, does deserve our better wishes. But, sir, sir, hear me, Sir Thomas. You're a gentleman of mine own way. I know you wise, religious, and let me tell you, it will ne'er be well. It will not, Sir Thomas Lovell, take it of me. Till Cranmer, Cromwell, her two hands, and she sleep in their graves. Now, sir, you speak of two the most remarked of the kingdom. As for Cromwell, beside that of the jewel house, is made master of the rolls and the king's secretary. Further, sir, stands in the gap and trade of mo preferments, with which the time will load him. The archbishop is the king's hand and tongue, and who dare speak one syllable against him? Yes, yes, Sir Thomas, there are that dare. And I myself had ventured to speak my mind of him. And indeed this day, sir, I may tell it you. I think I have incensed the lords of the council that he is, for so I know he is, they know he is, a most arch-heretic, a pestilence that does infect the land, with which they moved have broken with the king, who hath so far given ear to our complaint of his great grace and princely care, for seeing those fell mischiefs our reasons laid before him, hath commanded tomorrow morning to the council board he be convented. He is a rank weed, Sir Thomas, and we must root him out. From your affairs I hinder you too long. Good night, Sir Thomas. Many good nights, my lord. I rest your servant. Charles, I will play no more tonight. My mind's not on it. You're too hard for me. Sir, I did never win of you before. But little, Charles, nor shall not, when my fancy's on my play. Now, Lovell, from the Queen, what is the news? I could not personally deliver to her what you commanded me, but by her woman I sent your message, who returned her thanks in the great humbleness, and desired your Highness most heartily to pray for her. What sayest thou? Huh? To pray for her? What is she crying out? So said her woman and that her sufferance made almost each pang a death. Alas, <gasps> good lady! God safely quit her of her burden, and with gentle travail, to the gladding of your highness with an air. Tis midnight, Charles, prithee to bed, and in thy prayers remember the estate of my poor queen. Leave me alone. 
for I must think of that which company would not be friendly to. I wish your highness a quiet night, and my good mistress will remember in my prayers. Charles, good night. Well, sir, what follows? Sir, I have brought my lord the archbishop as you commanded me. Ah, huh? Canterbury? Aye, my good lord. Oh, it is true. Where is he, Denny? He attends your highness' pleasure. Bring him to us. This is about that which the bishop spake. I am happily come hither. Avoid the gallery. Ah, I have said, be gone. I... What? I am fearful. Wherefore frowns he thus? Tis his aspect of terror. All's not well. How now, my lord? You do desire to know wherefore I sent for you. It is my duty to attend your highness' pleasure. Pray you arise, my good and gracious lord of Canterbury. Come, you and I must walk a turn together. I have news to tell you. Come, come. Give me your hand. Oh, my good lord, I grieve at what I speak, and am right sorry to repeat what follows. I have... And most unwillingly, of late heard many grievous, I do say, my lord, grievous complaints of you, which, being considered, have moved us and our counsel that you shall this morning come before us. For I know you cannot with such freedom purge yourself, but that till further trial in those charges which will require your answer, you must take your patience to you and be well contented to make your house our tower. <laughs> You, a brother of us, it fits with us proceed, or else no witness would come against you. I humbly thank your highness, and I'm right glad to catch this good occasion, most truly to be winnowed, where my chaff and corn shall fly asunder, for I know there's none stands under more calumnious tongues than I myself, poor man. Stand up, good Canterbury. Thy truth and thy integrity is rooted in us, thy friend. Give me thy hand, stand up. Prithee, let's walk. Now, by my holidom, what manner of man are you? My lord, I looked you would have given me your petition that I should obtain some pains to bring together yourself and your accusers and to have heard you without endurance further. Most dread liege, the good I stand on is my truth and honesty. If they shall fail, I with mine enemies will triumph o'er my person, which I weigh not, being of those virtues vacant. I fear nothing what can be said against me. Know you not how your state stands in the world? With the whole world? Your enemies are many and not small. Their practices must bear the same proportion, and not ever the justice and the truth of the question carries the due of the verdict with it. At what ease might corrupt minds procure knaves as corrupt to swear against you? Such things have been done. You are potently opposed, and with a malice of as great size. We knew of better luck, I mean in perjured witness, than your master, whose minister you are, whilst here he lived upon this naughty earth. Oh, go to, go to. You take a precipice for no leap of danger and woo your own destruction. God and your majesty protect mine innocence, for I fall into the trap is laid for me. Be of good cheer. They shall no more prevail than we give way to. Keep comfort to you, and this morning see you do appear before them. If they shall chance, in charging you with matters, to commit you, the best persuasions to the contrary fail not to use, and with what vehemency the occasion shall instruct you, if entreaties will render you no remedy. This ring, deliver them, and your appeal to us there make before them. Look, the good man weeps. He's honest on mine honour, God's blessed mother. I swear he is true-hearted and a soul none better in my kingdom. Get you gone, and do as I have bid you. He has strangled his language in his tears. Come back! What mean you? I'll not come back. The tidings that I bring will make my boldness manners. <gasps> Now, good angels, fly over thy royal head and shade thy person under their blessed wings. <laughs> now, by thy looks, I guess thy message. Is the queen delivered? Say, I. 
and of a boy. Aye, aye, my liege, and of a lovely boy. <laughs> the God of heaven both now and ever bless her. <clears throat> Tis a girl. <clears throat> Promises boys hereafter. <clears throat> Sir, your queen desires your visitation and to be acquainted with this stranger. Tis as like you as cherry is to cherry. Lovell. Sir. Give her an hundred marks. I'll to the queen. Hundred marks? By this light I'll have more. An ordinary groom is for such payment. I will have more or scold it out of him. Said I for this the girl was like to him. I'll have more or else unsait. And now, while tis hot, I'll put it to the issue. I hope I am not too late. And yet the gentleman that was sent to me from the council prayed me to make great haste. All fast? What means this? Ho! Oh, who waits there? Sure you know me. Yes, my lord. But yet I cannot help you. Why? Your grace must wait till you be called for. So? This is a piece of malice. I am glad I came this way so happily. The king shall understand it presently. Tis Butts, the king's physician. As he passed along, how earnestly he cast his eyes upon me. Pray heaven he sound not my disgrace. For certain this is of purpose laid by some that hate me. God turn their hearts, I never sought their malice, to quench mine honour. They would shame to make me wait else at door. A fellow counsellor among boys, grooms, and lackeys. But their pleasures must be fulfilled, and I attend with patience. I'll show your grace the strangest sight. What's that, Bunce? I think your highness saw this many a day. What do you mean? Where is it? There, my lord. The high promotion of his grace of Canterbury who holds his state at door amongst pursuivants, pages, and footboys. Huh? Tis he, indeed. Is this the honour they do one another? Tis well there's one above them yet. I had thought they had parted so much honesty among them, at least good manners, as not thus to suffer a man of his place, so near our favour, to dance attendance on their lordship's pleasures, and to the door, too, like a post with packets. Why, holy Mary, but there's knavery. Let him alone. Draw the curtain close. We shall hear more anon. Speak to the business, Master Secretary. Why are we met in council? Please, Your Honours, the chief cause concerns his Grace of Canterbury. Has he had knowledge of it? Yes. Who waits there? Without my noble lord? Yes. My lord Archbishop, and has done half an hour to know your pleasures. Let him come in. Your Grace may enter now. My good Lord Archbishop, I'm very sorry to sit here at this present and behold that chair stand empty, but we all are men in our own natures frail and capable of our flesh. Few are angels, out of which frailty and want of wisdom you, that best should teach us, have misdemeaned yourself, and not a little. Toward the king first, then his laws, in filling the whole realm by your teaching and your chaplains, for so we are informed, with new opinions, diverse and dangerous, which are heresies and not reformed, may prove pernicious. Which reformation must be sudden too, my noble lords. For those that tame wild horses, pace them not in their hands to make them gentle, but stop their mouths with stubborn bits and spur them till they obey the manage. If we suffer... Out of our easiness and childish pity to one man's honour, this contagious sickness. Farewell all physic. And what follows then? Commotions, uproars, with a general taint of the whole state. As of late days, our neighbours, the upper Germany, can dearly witness, yet freshly pitted in our memories. My good lords, 
Hitherto, in all the progress both of my life and office, I have labored, and with no little study, that my teaching and the strong course of my authority might go one way and safely, and the end was ever to do well, nor is there living. I speak it with a single heart, my lords, a man that more detests, more stirs against both in his private conscience and his place, defacers of a public peace than I do. Pray heaven the king may never find a heart with less allegiance in it. Men that make envy and crooked malice nourishment dare bite the best. I do beseech your lordships that in this case of justice my accusers, be what they will, may stand forth face to face and freely urge against me. Nay, my lord, that cannot be. You are a counsellor, and by that virtue no man dare accuse you. My lord... Because we have business of more moment, we will be short with you. Tis his highness' pleasure and our consent for better trial of you. From hence you be committed to the tower, where, being but a private man again, you shall know many dare accuse you boldly. More than I fear you are provided for. Ah, my good lord of Winchester, I thank you. You are always my good friend. If your will pass, I shall both find your lordship judge and juror. You are so merciful. I see your end. Tis my undoing. Love and meekness, lord, become a churchman better than ambition. Win straying souls with modesty again, cast none away. That I shall clear myself, lay all the weight ye can upon my patience. I make as little doubt as you do conscience in doing daily wrongs. I could say more, but reverence to your calling makes me modest. My lord, my lord, you are a sectary. That's the plain truth. Your painted gloss discovers to men that understand you words and weakness. My lord of Winchester, you are a little, by your good favor, too sharp. Men so noble, however faulty, yet should find respect for what they have been. Tis a cruelty to load a falling man. Good Master Secretary, I cry your honor mercy. You may worst of all this table say so. Why, my lord? Or do not I know you for a favorer of this new sect? Ye are not sound! Not sound! Not sound, I say! Would you were half so honest, men's prayers then would seek you, not their fears. I shall remember this bold language. Do, remember your bold life, too. That is too much. Forbear for shame, my lord. I have done. And I. Then thus for you, my lord. It stands agreed, I take it, by all voices, that forthwith you be conveyed to the tower a prisoner. There to remain till the king's further pleasure be known unto us. Are you all agreed, lord? We are. We are. Is there no other way of mercy but I must needs to the tower, my lord? What other would you expect? You are strangely troublesome. Let some of the guard be ready there. For me? Must I go like a traitor thither? Receive him and see him safe in the tower. Stay, good my lords! I have a little yet to say. Look there, my lords. By virtue of that ring, I take my cause out of the gripes of cruel men and give it to a most noble judge, the king, my master. This is the king's ring. It is no counterfeit. It is the right ring by heaven. I told you all when we first put this dangerous stone a rolling, twould fall upon ourselves. Do you think, my lords, the king will suffer but the little finger of this man to be vexed? Tis now too certain. How much more is his life in value with him? Would I were fairly out on it. My mind gave me in seeking tales and informations against this man, whose honesty the devil and his disciples only envy at. He blew the fire that burns ye. Now have at ye. <laughs> Dread sovereign. How much are we bound to heaven in daily thanks that gave us such a prince? Not only good and wise, but most religious. One that in all obedience makes the church the chief aim of his honor. And to strengthen that holy duty, out of dear respect, his royal self in judgment comes to hear the cause betwixt her and this great offender. You were ever good at sudden commendations, Bishop of Winchester. But no, I come not to hear such flattery now. And in my presence they are too thin and base to hide offences. 
to me you cannot reach. You play the spaniel and think with wagging of your tongue to win me. But whatsoe'er thou takest me for, I'm sure thou hast a cruel nature and a bloody. My lord of Canterbury, good man, sit down. Now let me see the proudest he that dares most but wag his finger at thee. By all that's holy, he had better starve than but once think his place becomes thee not. May it please your grace. No, sir, it does not please me. I had thought I had had men of some understanding and wisdom of my counsel, but I find none. Was it discretion, lords, to let this man, this good man, few of you deserve that title, this honest man, wait like a lousy footboy at chamber door and one as great as you are? Why, what a shame was this! Did my commission bid ye so far forget yourselves? I gave ye power as he was a counsellor to try him, not as a groom. And there's some of ye, I see, more out of malice than integrity, would try him to the utmost, had ye mean, which ye shall never have while I live. Thus far, my most dread sovereign, may it like your grace to let my tongue excuse all. Mm. What was purposed concerning his imprisonment was rather, if there be faith in men, meant for his trial and fair purgation to the world than malice, mm. I'm sure, in me. Oh, well, well. Oh, my lords, respect him, take him, and use him well. He's worthy of it. I will say thus much for him. If a prince may be beholding to a subject, I am for his love and service so to him. Make me no more ado, but all embrace him. Be friends for shame, my lords. My lord of Canterbury, I have a suit which you must not deny me. That is, a fair young maid that yet wants baptism. You must be godfather and answer for her. The greatest monarch now alive may glory in such an honour. How may I deserve it that I'm a poor and humble subject to you? Oh, come, come, my lord. Yet spare your spoons. <laughs> you shall have two noble partners with you, the old Duchess of Norfolk and Lady Marquis Dorset. Will these please you? Once more, my lord of Winchester, I charge you embrace and love this man. With a true heart and brother love, I do it. <laughs> and let heaven witness how dear I hold this confirmation. Good man, those joyful tears show thy true heart. The common voice I see is verified of thee, which says thus, Do my lord of Canterbury a shrewd turn, and he's your friend forever. <laughs> <laughs> Come, lords, we trifle time away. I long to have this young one made a Christian. As I have made ye one, lords, one remain. So I grow stronger, you more honour gain. You leave your noise and on, ye rascals! Do you take the court for Paris Garden? Ye rude slaves, leave your gaping! Good master porter, I belong to the larder! Belong to the gallows and be hanged, ye rogue! Is this a place to roar in? Fetch me a dozen crab trees, staves, and strong ones! These are but sweaters to them! I scratch your heads! You must be saying christenings! Do you look for ale and cakes here, you rude rascals? Pray, sir, be patient. It is as much impossible unless we sweep them from the door with cannons to scatter them as it is to make them sleep on May Day morning, which will never be. We may as well push against pools as stir them. How get the end and be hanged? Unless I know not, how gets the tide in? As much as one sound cudgel of four foot, you see the poor remainder could distribute. I made no spare, sir. You did nothing, sir. I am not Samson, nor Sir Guy, nor Colbrand to mow them down before me. But if I spared any that had a head to hit, either young or old, he or she, cuckold or cuckold maker, let me ne'er hope to see a chine again. And that I would not for a cow, God save her. Do you hear, Master Porter? I shall be with you presently, good Master Poppy. 
keep the door closed, sir. What would you have me do? What should you do but knock him down by the dozens? Is this more fields to muster in? Or have we some strange Indian with a great tool come to court? The woman so besieges. Bless me, what a fray of fornication is at door. On my Christian conscience, this one christening will beget a thousand. They'll be father, godfather, and all together. The spoons will be the bigger, sir. But there is a fellow somewhat near the door. He should be a brazier by his face. For on my conscience, twenty of the dog days now rain in his nose. All that stand about him are under the line. They need no other penance. That fire drake did I hit three times on the head, and three times was his nose discharged against me. He stands there like a mortar piece to blow us. There was a haberdasher's wife of small wit near him that railed upon me till a pinked porringer fell off her head for kindling such a combustion in the state. I missed a meteor once and hit that woman who cried out, Clubs! When I might see from far some forty truncheoners draw to her succour, which were a hope of the strand where she was quartered, they fell on. I made good my place. At length they came to the broomstaff to me. I defied them still, when suddenly a file of boys behind them, loose shot, delivered such a shower of pebbles that I was fain to draw my honour in and let them win the work. The devil was amongst them, I think, surely. These are the Jews that thundered at a playhouse and fight for bitten apples. That no audience but the tribulation of Tower Hill or the limbs of Limehouse their dear brothers are able to endure. I have some of them in Limbo Patrum, and there they are like to dance these three days. Besides the running banquet of two beetles that is to come. Mercy of me, what a multitude are here! They grow still, too, from all parts they are coming, as if we kept a fair here. Where are these porters, these lazy knaves? You've made a fine hand, fellows. There's a trim rabble let in. Are all these your faithful friends of the suburbs? We shall have great store of room, no doubt, left for the ladies when they pass back from the christening. And please, your honour, we are but men. And what so many may do, not being torn to pieces, we have done. An army cannot rule them. As I live, if the king blame me for it, I'll lay ye all by the heels and suddenly, and on your heads clap round fines for neglect, ye lazy knaves. And here ye lie, baiting of bombards when ye should do service. Hark, the trumpets sound. They're come already from the christening. Go break among the press and find a way out to let the troop pass fairly, or I'll find a marshal so he shall hold ye play these two months. Make way there for the princess! You great fellow, stand close up or I'll make your head ache! You are the tremblet! Get up on the rail! I'll pick you out the pains of... Enter two aldermen, Lord Mayor, Garter, Cranmer, Duke of Norfolk with his marshal's staff, Duke of Suffolk, two noblemen bearing great standing bowls for the christening gifts, then four noblemen bearing a canopy, under which the Duchess of Norfolk, godmother, bearing the child richly habited in a mantle, the train borne by a lady. Then follows the Marchioness Dorset, the other godmother, and ladies. Heaven, from thy endless goodness, send prosperous life, long and ever happy, to the high and mighty Princess of England, Elizabeth! <laughs> And to your royal grace and the good queen, my noble partners and myself thus pray, all comfort, joy in this most gracious lady, heaven ever laid up to make parents happy, may hourly fall upon ye. Thank you, good lord archbishop. What is her name? Elizabeth. Stand up, Lord. With this kiss, take my blessing. God protect thee, into whose hand I give thy life. Amen. My noble gossips, ye have been too prodigal. I thank ye heartily. So shall this lady, when she has so much English. Let me speak, sir, for heaven now bids me. 
and the words I utter let none think flattery, for they'll find them truth. This royal infant, heaven still move about her, though in her cradle, yet now promises upon this land a thousand thousand blessings, which time shall bring to ripeness. She shall be, but few now living can behold that goodness, a pattern to all princes living with her, and all that shall succeed. Saba was never more covetous of wisdom and fair virtue than this pure soul shall be. All princely graces that mould up such a mighty peace as this is, with all the virtues that attend the good, shall still be doubled on her. Truth shall nurse her, holy and heavenly thoughts still counsel her. She shall be loved and feared. Her own shall bless her. Her foes shake like a field of beaten corn and hang their heads with sorrow. Good grows with her. In her days, every man shall eat in safety under his own vine what he plants, and sing the merry songs of peace to all his neighbors. God shall be truly known, and those about her, from her shall read the perfect ways of honor, and by those claim their greatness, not by blood. Nor shall this peace sleep with her, but as when the bird of wonder dies, the maiden phoenix, her ashes new create another heir, as great in admiration as herself. So shall she leave her blessedness to one when heaven shall call her from this cloud of darkness, who from the sacred ashes of her honor shall star-like rise as great in fame as she was, and so stand fixed. Peace, plenty, love, truth, terror, that were the servants to this chosen infant, shall then be his, and like a vine grow to him. Wherever the bright sun of heaven shall shine, his honor and the greatness of his name shall be and make new nations. He shall flourish and like a mountain cedar reach his branches to all the plains about him. Our children's children shall see this and bless heaven. Thou speakest wonders. She shall be to the happiness of England an aged princess. Many days shall see her, and yet no day without a deed to crown it. Would I had known no more, but she must die. She must. The saints must have her. Yet a virgin, a most unspotted lily, shall she pass to the ground, and all the world shall mourn her. O Lord Archbishop, thou hast made me now a man. Never before this happy child did I get anything. This oracle of comfort has so pleased me that when I am in heaven I shall desire to see what this child does and praise my maker. I thank ye all. To you, my good Lord Mayor, and you, good brethren, I am much beholding. I have received much honour by your presence, and ye shall find me thankful. Lead the way, lords. Ye must all see the Queen, and she must thank ye. She will be sick else. This day no man think has business at his house, for all shall stay. This little one shall make it holiday. <laughs> Thank you.
'Tis ten to one this play can never please all that are here. Some come to take their ease and sleep an act or two, but those, we fear, we have frighted with our trumpets, so tis clear they'll say it is naught. Others to hear the city abused extremely, and to cry, that's witty, which we have not done neither. That I fear all the expected good we are like to hear for this play at this time is only in the merciful construction of good women, for such a one we show them. If they smile and say it will do, I know within a while all the best men are ours. For tis ill hap if they hold when their ladies bid em clap. In Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. The cast in order of appearance were Prologue, Epilogue, Griffith and Stage Directions, Sean Baker. Buckingham and the Chancellor, David Yelland. Norfolk and Messenger, Anton Lesser. Abergavenny, Vaux, Mann, Scribe and Denny, Alan Westaway. Wolsey, Timothy West. John McAndrew was the First Secretary, the Second Gentleman and Butts. Michael N. Harbour, Brandon, Servant, Cryer and Cranmer. And Ian Gelder, Sergeant, Suffolk and the Keeper. Henry was played by Paul Jessen. Catherine, Jane Lapater, the surveyor, Campeus and Porter, Anthony Jackson, Chamberlain, David Shaw Parker, Sands and Surrey, Stephen Mangan, Lovell and Gentleman, Nicholas Rowe, Guilford, Cromwell and Capuchius, Nicholas Murchie, Anne Bullen, Catherine Slesinger, First Gentleman, Lincoln and the Garter, Alan Cox, Third Gentleman and Gardener, Steve Hodson, and the Old Lady in Patience, Maria Charles. The musicians were on violins, Fiona McCapra, Stephen Morris, Jeremy Morris, and Richard George. Violas, Helen Cominga and Tim Grant. Shelley, Sean Bell and Adrian Bradbury. Oboe, Melinda Maxwell. Flute, Anna Noakes. Tabor and Timpani, Phil Hopkins. Sackbutts, Adrian France, Abigail Newman and Adam Wolfe. And trumpets, Paul Sharp and Simon Mundy. The music was composed and conducted by Dominique Lejeune. Henry VIII was directed by Clive Brill. Henry VIII.